Subcommittee on Oversight and Accountability will come to order. The purpose of this hearing is to examine the State Department's climate policy and the budget of the Special Presidential Envoy for Climate's Office. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. As we examine the State Department's climate agenda and budget, we are joined today by former Secretary of State John Kerry. Thank you for being here today. First ever Special Presidential Envoy for Climate. Mr. Kerry, you're sitting in a newly created position, but from all of the research that I've done in two years, you've largely managed to avoid any real oversight or accountability in that position. Now, my community cares about this as an issue. We sit on Florida's East Coast. We felt the consequences of environmental disaster. I'm a member of the Bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus, a co-chair of the Roosevelt Conservation Caucus. And I believe that it's critical that we do work to defend our environment, clean air, clean water, public health. Protecting our environment is important. I don't know a person literally in Congress that doesn't believe that protecting our environment is important. But as you and I have discussed, and I've said this to you before, you can't worry about the efficiency of your home if you can't make rent, if you can't make your, war your mortgage payment, and you can't worry about the emissions of your automobile payment, of your automobile if you can't make the, the payments on your car. You can't worry about the way America is electrified, or you have to worry about the way America is electrified as we look to the future to make sure that our electric grid can support the policies that are being pushed. And it seems in many cases like you are hell-bent on enacting policies, not by votes through the House of Representatives and the Senate, but by fiat. Secretary Blinken has said that your leadership will be indispensable in weaving climate into the fabric of everything we do at State Department. Personally, I don't believe that climate should be the focus of every part of diplomacy, which is the job of the State Department. And I believe that we probably disagree about that, but regardless, it is clear to me that you, even having served as a longtime senator, you are willing to push the envelope of what it means to live in a constitutional republic in order to get the agenda that the administration sees enacted. And no matter how somebody watching this hearing feels about climate change, I believe that that should be of large concern to them. This is my chief concern about your office. You're serving on the National Security Council, but you're not confirmed by the Senate. In your previous role as Secretary of State, you unilaterally entered our nation into some of the largest agreements, like the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the Iran nuclear deal, unilaterally bound Americans to set standards that would dramatically increase their cost of living or affect their way of life in the Paris Climate Accords. And I believe that speaks volumes about your overarching philosophy as it applies to governing and what you're doing now as what some people have called the climate czar. Mr. Kerry, nobody voted for you in this body. It seems like, once again, the rules don't apply to the president's inner circle. You, he has called you his best buddy. That brings me to my second concern that I want to speak about today, and it's just basic levels of transparency, the mechanisms of transparency in government that your office has not participated in to be accountable to the people. Every time you travel to a climate summit or Kim, King Charles coronation or the wedding of the Crown Prince of Jordan, you're supposed to document the carbon emissions generated by your trip. Your office has failed to do so. You're supposed to produce an organizational chart of your office. Your office only did so when there was a lawsuit filed and filled in none of the names of the people that work in your office. You ignore most congressional requests for documents, have ignored those from the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the House Oversight Committee for months. You're supposed to respond to FOIA requests but claim that it would take years to produce basic budgetary information, in some cases not willing to release it until 2024. You're supposed to be clear about the work that you do on behalf of the American people, but you don't have a landing page on the State Department's website. I don't believe this is how you fulfill the White House's promise to bring transparency and truth back to government. And it is my assessment that you are afraid of the American people knowing exactly what it is that you are up to at places like the climate change conferences that you attend. You are headed off to COP28 soon. You've been to COP27 and other summits and purporting to represent the United States of America but you're not representing the United States of America's people, in my opinion. I believe that you are representing a far-left radical agenda. Those are my beliefs. But the truth is, 
because of the lack of transparency, no one really knows exactly what it is that you are representing. So in that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Ranking Member Crow, or I don't know if you want to turn it over to Mr. Meeks first or not, but uh, I will turn it over to you for an opening statement, my friend. Thank you, Chairman Mask, and, and thank you, Mask, and thank you to our witness, uh, Secretary Kerry, uh, for appearing here today. Um, it, it is safe to say that I have a very different view uh, of your work and uh, this uh, subject than uh, my friend, uh, Chairman Mast. I represent a district in Colorado, a state that has been shaped dramatically every year by changes to our climate. A climate crisis is real. Uh, there is no doubt about that. Uh, my constituents know that. As we sit here right now, millions of Americans are dealing with extreme weather events that are causing uh, terrible, terrible disasters across vast swaths of our country. Uh, I agree that uh, issues of helping our constituents pay their mortgage is important, but it's hard to pay your mortgage if your house is underwater. It's hard to pay your electric bill if it's 110 degrees for weeks and weeks on end, and that is the reality that so many of our constituents and so many Americans are facing. The climate crisis is going to have profound impacts on our water supply, uh, on drought conditions that increase the risk of destructive wildfires and limit agricultural yields, and on infrastructure that's damaging, uh, being damaged by heavy rains and extreme disasters every day. The growing reality for so many in Colorado is one of increasingly familiar uh, to those across the nation, whether it be poor air quality from wildfire smoke, extreme heat or massive flooding, the ramifications of climate change are widely felt. A changing climate has and will dra drive mass migration. It will exacerbate food insecurity, it will worsen health indicators, and it will challenge every government on Earth to adapt to extreme stress on the goods and services they need to deliver for their citizens. This global problem then requires global solutions. Just as we have sat in this room and discussed the need to work with partners to counter Russian aggression, to compete with the PRC, and to provide aid across the world to those who need it, addressing climate relies on multilateral efforts, perhaps more so than any other. Securing more ambitious commitments from countries around the world is only one part of the puzzle. Our climate policies must also include the onshoring of supply chains for critical technologies and reducing our reliance on fossil fuels. As an added benefit, these policies will drive economic growth, strengthen industry, and create new jobs in the process. These solutions are necessary because climate change stresses not one system, but all of them. As a former Army Ranger and in my work in Congress through the Foreign Affairs and Armed Services Committee and the Intel Committee, I've directly wrestled with the national security impact of our changing climate. That national security impact may be the resiliency of our nation's bases. It can have uh, on our existing infrastructure to withstand rising sea levels and extreme weather events. The question is, are we resilient in ensuring that we can sustainably defend our nation without delay or obstruction? <clears throat> the instability that climate change drives can also create new national security challenges beyond our borders. How will we respond to the millions of people across the world who lack sufficient food, clean water, shelter, medica medical care, functioning infrastructure, safety from conflict, and reliable good governance. The diplomacy that we need to meet these challenges head on requires that we lead by example. The absence of our leadership would leave an open door for other nations, including China, to fill in our stead. I am very encouraged by this administration's efforts to recommit the United States to environmental protection into bold multilateral engagement. The placement of the SBEC role at the cabinet level is a clear indicator to all that we are serious about making demonstrable gains on climate policy. The administration's reentry into the Paris Climate Accord, various executive orders on climate change, and review of environmental rollbacks sought in recent years show that we are pursuing evidence-based policymaking across the federal government at home and abroad. So I look forward to our witness speaking to these critical concerns and answering our questions to the best of his knowledge and ability. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ranking Member Crow. We're pleased to have the uh, chairman and ranking member of the full committee with us. And so I will now rec uh, recognize uh, Chairman McCall for an opening statement. No, thank you, Chairman Mast, uh, for today's, today's hearing. And um, let me say first, before I get into my statement, that I am working on a 
project, uh, <clears throat> International Conservation Act. We have about 10 billionaires that want to uh, provide um, in a very generous manner uh, money uh, to help us with conservation, both uh, wildlife conservation, uh, fisheries from China, uh, and the rainforest, which are the lungs of the planet. Um, <clears throat> and this would be a two to one match with the USG. Those are productive things. I think these self-imposed mandates that China doesn't have to follow really makes no sense to me at all. Um, but I wanna thank you, Secretary, for being here today. I know it's not always pleasant appearing before Congress, but you will remember this, well, on the Senate side, you remember this uh, distinguished body for quite some time. Um, let me just start talking about China. Um, and I know you're getting, you're preparing for a trip to China, as I understand. Is that correct, sir? Yeah. And uh, yes, sir. as you know, we are in a global balance of power. Competition, great power competition. Um, <clears throat> they've increased their aggression in the Indo-Pacific, especially towards Taiwan. I just came back from Taiwan two months ago, and I was greeted by an armada of battleships surrounding the island, an aircraft carrier and 70 fighter jets conducting live fire exercises. And then I was sanctioned the last day I was there as we departed Taiwan. And I say that, not that I want any sympathy for that, other than to say it's getting very aggressive. China is getting very hostile in the, in the, in the Pacific. And we need to take this issue extremely seriously. I hope you will talk to them about their aggression in the region as you talk to them about climate change. <clears throat> I believe they're the greatest threat to our national security. Um, I think countering China and their malign agenda should be the top priority of the State Department. And I'm concerned the administration is prioritizing their own sort of political agenda over this national security issue. When you look at China also, it's, just, it, it's disturbing. They're not an honest broker when it comes to addressing emission reduction, as you know. They are held to a different standard than we are under the Paris Agreement. Yet they're the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases and have shown no sign of relenting. They fire a coal plant up you know, pretty much every day, uh, if not week. And in the last few years, their greenhouse emissions have exceeded those of the United States and all developing nations combined. They are the number one offender of polluting the planet. In fact, in 2021, after pledging to show, quote, the highest possible ambition to address climate change, they added the equivalent, <clears throat> going back to the coal plants, of 100 coal-powered plants to their grid. Same year, China had a record of increased increases in emissions under the Paris Climate Accords, as you know, sir. It allows the CCP to actually increase their emissions until 2030, while the United States and other economic powers are forced to cut them. This should be an agreement that applies equally to all and not favoring China. They should not have most favored nation status. And shockingly, because China classifies himself this is one that really gets me, Secretary. They classify themselves as a developing nation, right? They're the second greatest economic empire in the world. Yet, by the United Nations standards, they're a developing nation. So what does that mean? That means they're given deferential treatment in other international climate treaties. China's the second largest economy in the world. They're not a developing nation. And that also entitles them to World Bank loans at low interest or zero interest that they use then to fund their Belt and Road Initiative, where they get countries into debt trap, rape the rare earth minerals, bring in their own workers, and then when they go into bankruptcy, guess who bails them out? The IMF at the American taxpayer's expense. I don't know how you can negotiate with the CCP when they're knowingly abusing these global systems to avoid purposefully their emissions. And why is the administration continuing to funnel so much taxpayer money to our greatest adversary with things like the UN Green Climate Fund, 
when it's clear they have no interest in reducing their emissions. Moreover, China controls 80 to 85 percent of the rare earth minerals needed to produce batteries, solar panels, and semiconductors. As you testified before this uh, committee previously, the Uyghur Muslims and ethnic minorities are forced to produce components for solar panels in the Xinjiang region of China. The Biden administration, rightfully so, has classified their actions against the Uyghurs as genocide. Genocide. Yet, sir, when I asked you a question the last time you appeared before this committee, and I'll wait till you're done with your little sidebar conversation, because it's important for you to hear this. The last time you were here, I asked you about the impact this genocide would have on your climate change agenda. And you replied, well, quote, life is full of choices, end of quote. Well, when it comes to ending genocide, there are no tough choices. And the fact that you think it's in, it, it, that, that it's just a tough choice and we're just going to have to let them do what they do uh, is incredibly concerning. The United States should always choose human rights, human dignity, and human life. I'm deeply concerned the administration continues to engage with the CCP with no real results or anything to show for it. I agree you have to talk to them. I talked to Secretary Blinken. I encouraged him to engage in diplomacy with China. We have to talk to him. But we don't have to make concessions before we even get to the table. Do you know that we stopped enforcing our sanctions against human rights violations just to get a meeting with Chairman Xi? Do you know that we, we stopped enforcing our export controls going to Huawei from this country just to get a meeting with Chairman Xi? That is not a way to negotiate. And I want to raise one last thing. There's a man named Mark Swyden. He's a Texan. He's been held captive by the CCP for over a decade. He's innocent. He didn't do anything wrong. He's been charged with fabricated charges, uh, drug possession, and now he is scheduled to be executed by the Chinese Communist Party for doing nothing wrong. He will be executed if we do nothing to stop this. I would implore you, sir, as you talk about climate, that you also bring up human rights violations and the fact that an American citizen is sitting in a Chinese prison marked for death by the CCP who will be executed soon if you, sir, and your administration does nothing to help him. It's a dire situation. His family, his mother, Catherine, I've talked to them. They simply want their son back home. And I, I pray that you can help return this man to the United States. And with that, uh, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Meeks. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, ranking member Crow. Um, I believe the title of this subcommittee hearing is a budget overview by the special presidential envoy for climate, which is tremendously important because there's only one planet that we have. And if we're not focused on saving this planet, all of us, no matter where we are on the planet, are in peril. And that's why I thank you, Secretary Kerry, for joining us and for you and your team's consistent engagement with Congress, ensuring that we are informed and consulted on your work as Special Envoy. You have consistently come back to talk to Congress and the importance and demonstrated the importance of your work and the necessity of the United States leading in this area and talking about the needs and concerns because at times when you talk about our values, you talk about our budget. And this hearing is focused on the budget and the needs of what we need to do to help save the planet. Now last Congress, when I became 
chair of this committee, one of my priorities was to make sure that we consider the issue of climate change as part of our broader foreign policy thinking. Climate change and its effects are a national security issues, and it touches upon all aspects of our economy and society. I was immensely pleased to see the Biden administration appoint especially you as special envoy based upon your long work in this area, whether it was your work in the United States Senate or your work as Secretary of State of this great country. You and your administration's work is critical domestically and internationally. And I, along with most of the world, was relieved to see the United States back at the table, not only in climate negotiations, but also in many other areas of diplomacy, like we just saw yesterday in NATO. Not calling NATO irrelevant anymore, as others have, but showing the importance and significance of us working together in a diplomatic form, staying together. That is how Ukraine has been able to survive this long. Unity, leading, and bringing us back. Because the lack of American leadership and the consequences of an America first, America alone agenda, hurts our international standing. Not only is the United States back as a responsible global actor, but we're also leading again, including in the international climate space, from rallying allies to address urgent adaptability issues, leveraging the private sector response, or working with like-minded partners to make sure our common values are protected. The United States is again leading the world. Even when it comes to curbing the emissions of the world's largest emitter, China, there are areas where we can and must cooperate, as we've seen and as your mission will continue to do. We know that climate change, CO2 emissions, wildfires, etc., they have no borders. It's global. And addressing these issues is a Herculean task. But this global problem requires global solutions. Finally, let me be clear that I see your role as Special Envoy as critical to protecting and promoting American national security interests in a fast-changing world. Domestic policy is directly linked to international policy in the climate space. The Congress played an important role here, too, by passing the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill and the Inflation Reduction Act, which makes the single largest investment in climate and energy in American history. How we prepare for the transition to a green economy will have ramifications for all Americans, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you fall within the middle class, whether you live in the east, whether you live in the west, whether you live in the north, whether you live in the south, or whether you live in middle America. We see the effects of climate change affecting everyone. And it will affect future generations. So the United States can lead the way. And I conclude by saying thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your service. And I look forward to continuing to work with you and your team on addressing this critical challenge to save this place that we call Earth. It's the only place for all of human beings, whether you like someone or don't. We share this planet. If we don't save it, if we don't save it, if we don't do the things now, 
then God help us all. Thank you for your work, and I yield back. I ask unanimous consent that the gentleman from Texas, August Pfluger, be allowed to sit on the dais and participate in today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. Other members of the committee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record. We are pleased to have, as we mentioned already, a distinguished witness before us today on this topic. The Honorable John Kerry is the Special Presidential Envoy for Climate. Prior to his current position, Secretary Kerry was the 68th United States Secretary of State from 2013 to 2017, and a Senator from Massachusetts from 1985 until 2013. Thank you for being here today. Your full statement will be made a part of the record. I'll ask that you keep your spoken remarks to five minutes to allow for time for members' questions. And just to give a warning as we do move into questions after that, uh, members will be recognized for five minutes. If you get a question in before those five minutes are up, I'll give you about an extra minute to answer that question if they squeeze one in at the end there. I now recognize Secretary Kerry. I recognize you for your opening statement. Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you very, very much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for inviting me. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and uh, I'm very grateful to be here with uh, all of you. I want to thank the committee for inviting me here today to discuss the Biden-Harris administration budget, but obviously beyond the budget, issues uh, of concern to all of you. Uh, I would just, uh, as a point of personal privilege, say that uh, uh, I want to thank uh, uh, the chairman and, and ranking member Crow and anybody else who served our country in uniform for that service. And I think uh, it's fair for me to say that I recognize how much the perspective that you bring to the challenges of public life can draw on that experience. And I thank you for, for being here in that, in that way. Chairman McCall and uh, Ranking Member Meeks, thank you both for being here and for your comments. Um, and <clears throat> Mr. Chairman McCall, let me just say to you very directly that uh, uh, Secretary Blinken forcefully argued when he was on his visit to China about detainees, plural. Uh, and I can absolutely promise you that I will raise Mark Swiden's case particularly with the highest level leaders that I meet with. Uh, and report back to you on, you know, what we can achieve or not achieve, as the case may be. <clears throat> Let me just share very quickly, because you all know what's going on uh, internationally at this point. But, but the fact is, <clears throat> I mean, I've been following this issue since 1988, when Jim Hansen first testified to us in the Senate uh, on a hut, I think it was a June day, and said the climate change is happening, it's here, 88. And in 92, I went to uh, Rio with a lot of other senators and with President George Herbert Walker Bush, Republican, who signed an agreement that was reached there to deal with the climate crisis. But it was voluntary. Not much happened. So we're now at COP 28. 28. And we face an even larger crisis. It's clear from the science <clears throat> and the mounting evidence around the world that one of the most existential threats that we face that impacts every single member of Congress, every single family in our country, in the world, comes from the glowing, growing climate crisis. Uh, we're beyond just climate change, frankly. I don't refer to it as that anymore. It is only a massive crisis. And we can talk about that if you want to in the course of this morning. But we're living it every day. Our fellow Americans are living this every single day. Lives upended by heat domes in Florida and Texas. I just read that there are 100 degree days for the last weeks uh, in several locations. 95 degrees water in Florida, Florida Keys, 95, 96 reported. Uh, and extreme flooding in California, Vermont and places. And the capital of uh, Vermont, cars washed away people getting on the roofs to survive. So I'm not, I don't want to just belabor that. You hear about it, you know it. But our military leaders have stated that the climate crisis is without doubt a threat to our national security. And they have repeatedly termed it as a threat multiplier. 
And I was just in Vienna for the OSCE, the security you know, for Europe. The 57 different countries were there, uh, all of whom defining this challenge as a security threat. Uh, climate disruptions ex obviously exacerbate the competition over resources. They require our military to increasingly support humanitarian efforts in various parts of the world. And here at home, taxpayers are feeling this in a growing way in terms of the extreme weather event because every single extreme weather event comes with a big bill that we pay not to invest in technology, not to advance new jobs in the, in the sector, but just to clean up the mess, just to reconnect people to their electricity, rebuild destroyed homes and buildings. So with the devastation of this, this this crisis, honestly, I will tell you, as a veteran of 28 years here in the Congress, I really don't understand, I just frankly don't understand uh, why the opportunity of this crisis is not being seized more readily by everybody. Because just as the climate crisis is man-made, it comes from emissions that we don't capture, that we don't do anything with. It is from emissions. Everybody knows this. It's a scientific accepted fact around the world, and 190 countries are responding to that fact. But there is a massive opportunity, once in a generation opportunity, economically, which the IRA that passed is already carving an enormous path to prove to everybody. Uh, already, the Inflation Reduction Act has created over 100,000 jobs and in clean energy across the country. And along with the bipartisan infrastructure law, these critical investments being paired with diplomacy uh, now because the simple reason is no country can solve the climate crisis alone. This requires multilateralism automatically. If you didn't have an institution or some entity to make it happen, we'd have to invent it. Because if China doesn't, as you said, reduce its emissions, we're all in trouble. Russia, India, uh, Indonesia, Brazil, Mexico, countless countries all need to step up and be part of this solution. So we have worked with the EU to launch the Global Methane Pledge, which has spurred 150 plus countries around the world to slash methane emissions, methane being 20 to 80 times more destructive than CO2. We built on the Abraham Accords to support energy integration and resilience in the Middle East. And finally, we've supported US leadership and American companies on a new generation of nuclear energy uh, with, with Westinghouse winning the bid, which we helped work on uh, in uh, Poland for four new plants, uh, in addition to Bulgaria, where there's an additional uh, plant being built. So every step forward that this administration has taken has been really to protect our national security, to strengthen our economy, and leave behind a safer planet for our kids and grandkids, and also uh, to, to recognize that uh, uh, all of us have to be part of, of this uh, solution. Uh, also, every step we've taken is based on the best science that we can understand and determine. It's a matter of mathematics and physics not politics, not ideology. It is a response to the science. So that's one of the reasons why I am headed to the People's Republic of China this weekend, to engage in candid conversations between the world's two largest economies. And because every step forward depends not on one country acting alone, but acting all together, helping to push the rest of the world to do what we need to do to win this battle. It also depends on all of you, not as a matter of politics, but the mission, a special mission of meeting the moment in the best traditions of our country and our Congress. Mr. Secretary, so I'll I give thank you, about 30 you more and seconds. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. You didn't even need 30 more seconds. <coughs> I'm going to defer and recognize the chairman of the full committee for questions first. Uh, so, Mr. McCall, you are recognized for. Thank you, uh, five Chairman. Mass. Chairman. Um, let me say first, um, I always like to start on a positive note. I, I think, you know, look, we all recognize we have a, a problem. We, um, 
we all want to save the planet. I think we just uh, probably disagree on the way to get there, right? And I, I don't like the idea of holding China to a different standard than the United States. And that, sir, will be your great challenge uh, when you go to Beijing is trying to hold them to the same standards of the United States. And I think that's what the American people want and what the American people uh, deserve. Uh, if I could go back to what I said in my opening statement, and this just continues to baffle me that the second largest economy in the world is somehow treated as a developing nation for purposes of the, of the United Nations Charter. And it's a self-designation. They self-designate that they're a developing nation. So what does that mean? That means they're in the WTO. That means they're given preferential status when it comes to world bank loans. Uh, at sometimes low interest, sometimes zero interest loans. But then they turn around and use for at usurious rates to get truly developing nations in a debt trap. I think that's not only wrong, I think that's immoral. But then they, they extrapolate this argument, this logic, to climate change. They say, in their own words, they say China has been, uh, has said its carbon emissions should peak by 2030, and I assume that's why you're holding them to this 2030 standard in the Paris agreements, but then they say they decline with the goal of reaching carbon neutrality by 2060. Not 2030, 2060. And why do they say that? This is where it gets really amazing to me. You know, I'm an attorney by, by trade, and words matter. The country, the world's largest carbon emitter, has argued that it is still a developing economy and should not be held to the same standards as developed countries in reducing carbon emissions. My question, sir, is very simple and very straightforward. And I hope you will give me a good answer to this one. How in the world can the second largest economy maintain to you and the rest of the world with a straight face that they are a developing nation, giving them preferential treatment, not only that, to fund their Belt and Road, but to get this special designation to not comply with an agreement we have to comply with sooner, but in their interpretation, not until 20 60. And, sir, I, I'm not saying this to make anybody feel bad or be argumentative, but as you make your case to the American people, they don't understand this. If I talk to my constituents back home and say, yeah, you know, Secretary Kerry's going there, they're trying to save the world, it's great, but, but hey, guess what? China doesn't have to comply until 2060 because they lie and say they're a developing nation, self-designated. And guess what? The United States, we got to comply almost immediately. The American people understand fairness. And honestly, sir, they do not see this as fair. I can't disagree with that. They do not see it as fair because a lot of people are concerned about this differential in the designation. I'd just call your attention. Uh, let me just, first of all, I wanted to thank you for uh, the shark fin sales elimination, which has really had an impact. Uh, I, I've been passionate about the oceans for years, and we've had the ocean conferences, and that was one of the big issues that we had there, and that's a major step, so thank you. And also, um, I greatly appreciate the U.S. Foundation for International Conservation Act, Senator Kuhn, Senator Graham, et cetera. I think these are important steps, and they show what we can do on a bipartisan basis. Um, with respect to this develop developing, it, it, it should confound anybody at this point in time. And it's one of the topics. I've, I've raised this with my counterpart in China and others. Now, we are at a point in the process of the meetings that are, that are annual under the UN process where um, there is there's going to be a revisiting to that within that process. I think it's next year. And we've already been talking with people because uh, we're going to need to find a way to put more money on the table, concessionary funding, in order to attract some of the private capital that is necessary. Because in the end, no government's going to solve this problem. This is going to be solved by the private sector. And the private sector is already massively engaged 
We have a record amount of money moving into venture capital. We have a record amount of money uh, uh, that is uh, targeted for investment, but won't deploy without our ability to be able to reduce some of the risk, which is something my office, our office, has been working on very, very diligently. And, and I know my time's before the chairman gavels me down. I don't like to be gaveled yeah. down. I'm a chairman, so. <laughs> but, but let me just say, if you could walk away from the summit with just that one result, to take away their developing nation status, sir, I can't tell you how significant that would be to the rest of the world. Uh, for a lot of reasons. And you know it's not a fair designation. It's a self-designation. And Correct. But let me, can I say to you, Mr. Chairman? If you, I could have your assurance you're going to bring it up. Yeah. I, look, I understand that. Let me just be frank with you. Uh, that's not going to happen in this visit. Uh, it's just not a mechanism or a rationale. It's just not going to happen in this visit. But the Chinese government understands that this is a growing issue of concern. And, and I just respectfully would say to you, this comes out of, you know, I mentioned 28 cops, uh, and I've been to too many of them. Uh, and way back in 1997, when we had the cop in Kyoto, the Kyoto Agreement was reached, and it just couldn't work because it was mandatory. And a whole bunch of people said, with, with understandability, we're not going to do that if the Chinese aren't going to do that. So what's happened is we were, we've been deadlocked until Paris. Paris, the breakthrough in Paris was, okay, let's not continue to do nothing because of this designation issue. Let's at least get every country to agree to sign on to something. And what's happening is around the world, this has had impact. And it's actually working better than you might think, but not yet addressing the question you've raised. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. I now recognize Ranking Member Crow, who I believe will recognize Ranking Member Meeks. Yep, we're following the protocol. I recognize Ranking Member Meeks. <laughs> Sounds like spies like us, right? <laughs> doctor, doctor. Again, I thank the chairman doctor. and the ranking member for allowing both the, uh, uh, the chairman, Chairman McCall and myself to uh, ask our questions and, and be able to make opening statements. Um, and, and I think that where I wanted to go was right, which you were talking about when you dealt with the Paris Agreement. I was at uh, several cops myself and the last one in particular because as I look at this, it's the United States, but it's also the rest of the world. And so I'm interested in making sure, and I'm an admitted multilateralist, I feel that we've got to look at it and make sure that we're engaged with our <coughs> allies and friends, and even at times our adversaries, uh, to get things done and to accomplish things. So I was uh, curious to see what your uh, answer would be now that the Biden administration has re-entered into the Paris Agreement. Um, what kind of response have you gotten from our international partners that we are back into it? Whether we, and because I think collectively we got to deal with China, collectively we got to deal with other uh, emitters uh, like ourselves. How have you been received, and what do you think that uh, uh, to the benefit of us re-entering? Re well, Mr. Ranking Member, uh, without you know, patting ourselves on the back too much, I, I do want to say that President Biden's immediate reentry on the day of his inauguration and creation of this particular office and the commitments he's made, the fight he has been fighting to get the Inflation Reduction Act passed, it's an historic piece of legislation. Just today, before I came in here, ExxonMobil just announced a purchase but also uh, a focus uh, on, you know, ac accelerating the capture of emissions. And he point blank said, this is happening partly because of the Inflation Reduction Act. So the incentive that has been created now for uh, massive transformation, we've seen more than 80 battery companies created that are now beginning to uh, uh, sort of address the supply chain issue. So I'm not going to go through the whole list, but together with our European allies, with the EU, and with friends around the world, Australia, Japan, Korea, Canada, others, they have all come to the table. And there is now a really re-energized international effort to do what is necessary to try to meet uh, the needs of this challenge. 
And, and I'm very proud. I think President Biden has really ignited uh, a whole new round of uh, activity that we hope is going to be different from what's gone before. So one of the, over the last couple of days, particularly in regards to you know, what just took place at the NATO summit, there was a question about uh, the durability of the United States commitments to Ukraine. Uh, I'm wondering uh, what, if any, the questions that you've had with the allies with reference to the durability of the United States commitments to the climate, the issue of climate change. I want to stop saying climate Mr. Ranking Member, that's, that is a great question uh, and very, very relevant because I hear it all over the world. And, and in fact, the Chinese say to me and have said to me, well, how do we know that you're not going to have a change in administration? They're going to just leave it again. And we're out there working away, but you're not. And we have yet to produce the $100 billion that was promised for less developed countries to be able to make the tradition, the transition. We believe, hopefully, that can happen this year. But, um, and my answer to those people is not a political one. It's, it's an answer that I think is based in the reality of the American marketplace and the world's marketplace. CEOs of major companies that we're proud of in this country, Google, Apple, Microsoft, Salesforce, uh, Boeing, FedEx. I can run a long list of Fortune 500 companies, all of whom are now in this transition, changing their fleets to electric bus, to electric trucks, moving uh, forward. Ford Motor Company, General Motors, have joined our first movers coalition. They are buying green steel where they can find it for the making of their cars in order to send the market a demand signal. And you also have, um, as I said, Ford and General Motors are transitioning so that by 2035, they hope 100% of the cars they're making in America will be electric. That's happening, not because the government mandated it, because they see that is the future. And, 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 and uh, you know, oil and gas companies and others are changing into energy companies and beginning to move. Now, you know, that takes us down a path. Maybe we'll talk about it later. But I just want to emphasize that people think this is now, un you know, you can't reverse it. It's irreversible. I believe that personally. I am convinced we are going to get globally to a low carbon, no carbon economy globally. What I'm not convinced of that we will do what the science says, which is get there in time to avoid the worst consequences of the crisis. And that's what they challenged us in 2018. They said, you have 12 years within which to make decisions that will avoid the worst consequences. That's what we're doing in our international diplomacy, trying to accelerate those decisions and accelerate the marketplace. We're not doing command and control. The Inflation Reduction Act is not a command and control act. It creates incentives, but businesses are making their own decision that that's worthwhile and the market is going to be there and they want to be there. Thank you, Ranking Member Meeks. I now recognize myself for five minutes. I just, again, I want to go back to my opening remarks. I want to talk about some of the lack of transparency and just say, Secretary, number one, can you direct me to your website, your landing page, your about your office section, mission statement section of your website? Well, I have a state.gov backslash whatever. I can direct you to the CN, the congressional notice, which had a very detailed chart that I have here, which lays but out every our consular, office. every bureau, every they have a, a website, tells about their mission statement, everything. Do you have that at state? Because I couldn't, honestly, myself and my staff, we couldn't find that. Well, we certainly have a location. <laughs> if you all find it, get it to we us. Use the to state it. We use the State Department website. So you use the states, but you don't have your own landing page on state that says about you, your mission statement, you name it. We check. I want to move on to some other levels of just what's going on with the hierarchy in your office. As I said, 2021 FOIA request, uh, your office replied that you wouldn't get back to it until about 2024. It's 2023. We'd like a few answers. Now, I'm not going to ask for every one of these, but I would love to know the names of the individuals that actually answer to you. Who are the ones that directly answer to you so we can know a little bit about it, your office? And then we'll give this chart to somebody in your office, and maybe they can fill out the rest of the names while you're here answering questions for us. It would be very helpful. 
Who is your deputy envoy for climate? I have two deputies, and uh, they are well known. They're very experienced people, Rick Duke and uh, Sue Binias. But I'm not going to go through all the Rick names Rick Duke here. and who? Mr. Chairman, Sue Binias, who's one of the most experienced negotiators in the world. Is Mr. Chairman, let me just say to you, deputy? Mr. Chairman, I'm not going to fill them in here in this way because that would be a violation of our process within the State Department. You're not going to tell us who's I'm not going to go office. through them by name because that is not the required process of the State Department. Who's the principal deputy for climate in your office? As I just said to you, Mr. Chairman. Who's the chief of staff? I am going to go through the normal process. Now, an algorithm kicked out that date, the, the one you're referring to. I'm not, not going to argue about date. it, Mr. Kerry, Secretary I'm, Kerry. I'm, I'm not going to argue about it. You said you're not going to answer. You're not going to answer. It's par for the course. No, I'm like going to answer said, there was a through the process. 2021 said it wasn't going to be answered until 2024. I'm not going to spend my time arguing about it. You said you're not going to answer now. Mr. Chairman, don't, don't just it. cut me off. What I'm trying to do is tell you I'm going to follow the process of the State Department, which is normally followed. Where there are circumstances requiring that someone know who the person is, the State Department has complied and, and done that. Every office, where every there consular, is not every a bureau, requirement they have a they, hierarchy. You where go there into is the military not a requirement. Base, it says Joe Biden. It says the secretaries. It says there's a hierarchy. This is standard practice for government. We not have argued that it's not standard with practice. The You've been at long notification enough. I want to point another arrow on my office. chart here, Mr. Secretary. We presented you just help us out? that answer. Do you answer to the executive office of the president, or do you answer to Secretary Blinken? Because I have emails I respond from directly to the President of the United States, but... Directly with, to the President. That is correct. But with the Secretary, with Secretary Blinken, uh, uh, completely informed and aware of everything that But you don't doing. answer to Blinken. Thank you. Well, it's good. We just need to know for basic levels of transparency and, uh, and understanding how this works. I want to go to a couple of questions on policy. Um, it was said by my colleague, global problems require global commitments. Um, and I want to go to some of the global commitments that you might be looking at in COP28 that were looked at in COP27. And I want to understand if you're committing the United States of America to these policies or, yes, or, or not. I'm going to just let you know. These are simple yes or no questions. I know you've researched them well. I've researched them well. We don't need an explanation of them here. So just number one, cross-border carbon trading. Are you planning at COP28 to commit? This is the number one issue there, along with uh, climate reparations. Do you plan to commit America to cross-border carbon trading, as my colleague put it, in global commitments? There's no uh, current proposal or plan that's been agreed to which would require us to do that. Do you plan on working on a global plan for cross-border carbon trading? We're exploring with a lot of countries what the various approaches might be, and President Biden has charged us to examine cross-border adjustment mechanisms in order to understand how we can deal with uh, how we can deal with the question of uh, very carbon intensive produced goods coming into our country where our folks are trying to uh, reduce it. I'll put yes, but say it's a maybe because you didn't answer concretely affirmatively. I'm going to ask one more question. Well, then though, you make this a game. If you're turning that into yes when I didn't say yes, you're playing games. You Mr. said it's Chairman. a maybe. You didn't say no. I didn't. didn't say well, why don't you create a maybe and put it up there? Next time I will create a maybe. We'll put it in yellow. We'll put uh, the, the yes in green and the no in red, and we'll put a maybe in yellow. Next time we'll do that. I do want to get to one last question. I'll give you a little extra time, ranking member. And that's on this one, because I know it's another major priority for COP. And that is, are you planning to commit America to climate reparations? That is to say, we have to pay some other country because they had a flood or they had a hurricane or a typhoon no, or a wildfire. Under no circumstances. Very good. I'm glad to hear you say that. I do have a no. I'll Why don't you create there. an exclamation point beside it, so, too, so you can get I something. will write in an exclamation point for you, okay. and I'm glad that we have agreement on that. I don't know if my black pen will work. We'll see. There we go. There's your exclamation point. Ranking Member Crow. I yield you five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Secretary Kerry, I'm not planning to game show this. Uh, I don't have a, a, a board, because um, that's a good theater, but it's not good uh, legislating, and it's not necessary oversight, in my view. Uh, nor am I going to ask any member of this committee who their scheduler is, who their comms director is, who their staff assistant is, because uh, that's not how this works. Uh, and, and we all know that, actually. Uh, and before you were cut off, 
uh, I, I believe you were about to say, and I'll give you an, uh, an opportunity to actually complete what you were going to say, uh, that you're going to follow the regular process and, and respond to the chairman's questions. Is that accurate? Uh, yes. Not only are we going to follow it, the, the, um, I believe that about 600 pages were delivered yesterday or the day before yesterday in answer. Look, there are a lot of requests that come in. There's a massive amount of requests and a very small office. And we have a, uh, uh, there are two tracks that we address. One is the oversight. We have oversight committee, uh, oversight personnel. They are the ones who are responsible for that. I, I don't literally touch that. It, it's, it goes directly to that office. The second track is through the FOIA track, where there is a formal process with an office in the State Department for FOIAs, and they are responded to as fast as they can be. So, you know, uh, if we could, I think our staff budgets were cut last year, not to mention, if we could get additional funding, we can have people speed it up. Yep. I appreciate that. And, and I, for one, have found you and your office to be nothing but transparent and forthcoming and, and cooperative. And there's no doubt in my mind that you'll continue to do that. But this is serious stuff, putting aside the, the graphics and uh, the, the back and forth here. And, and there's very serious strategic competition at play because uh, the People's Republic of China is moving extremely aggressively in areas of the global south, South America in particular, and engaging with, with countries that are trying to move them into their sphere of influence. Uh, on the issues of climate, on the issues of resiliency, I've had a lot of discussions with uh, leaders uh, in South America who said, you know, we'd love to partner with you on this, but you're, you're not coming to us uh, uh, as aggressively as, the chi as China is in some instances. So could you just speak to the importance of the United States in leading on this and continuing to double down on this issue from a strategic competition perspective? Well, this is the largest, this opportunity to transition to clean energy is without doubt the largest economic opportunity the world has seen since the Industrial Revolution. Bigger by far, even not necessarily an impact, uh, well, I'm, I'm not even sure I can say that, with respect to uh, the technology revolution, because technology is going to be a critical component of, what we're, of what's happening. You've got huge investments taking place in uh, green hydrogen, huge investments taking place in direct air carbon capture. A major company, uh, Occidental Energy Company, is pursuing that all in on direct air carbon capture. Others are trying to do other forms of capture and utilization and storage. Uh, batteries have made remarkable progress. That's going to continue. Uh, the cost of solar and wind is now almost uh, literally negative. I mean, it's, it's come down so far that it is, you know, almost the, the uh, uh, the go-to initial effort. So it's safe to say there's incredible economic opportunity that is there for the taking if we're able to engage strategically and take advantage of it. Uh, and, and we're competing against China and others for that. We are competing, but uh, and everybody has their own approach, and every, which is one of the exciting things here. We're not going to know what the winner is going to be necessarily, but there are going to be big winners here. and. I think that uh, we're seeing that transformation already taking place. And in the limited time, I, I want to push back on this fallacy, as I believe it, uh, that it's a sign of toughness. Some people will think that it's a sign of toughness and strength to walk away, to quit talking, to quit engaging, even if we have areas of mutual interest with some countries, of which we have very real concerns uh, and, and um, uh, you know, uh, skin in the game, so to speak. So can you just very briefly tell me why it's important to still engage with China and others, even if we have uh, a conflict and, and real disagreements in other areas? Well, the administration is determined to try to stabilize what is a very, what has been particularly recently, a very unstable situation. And uh, the president is obviously concerned, as I think most people are, about the potential for mistake the potential for something to inadvertently uh, drag us into an open, hot conflict where uh, up until now it's been, you know, sort of in a more uh, reserved fashion. 
I, I think that um, that those who are involved in that side of the fence, and I'm not, I am dealing only with the climate. And President Biden and President Xi specifically determined at the beginning of the administration that they were going to try to separate climate because it's not a bilateral issue. It is a global, universal issue which threatens everybody on the planet. And we don't want it to become the hostage of some of these other tensions, all of which are real. There isn't one iota of diminishing of the reality of those other challenges through our office or anyone else. So we're, we've been trying very hard to operate in a way that uh, uh, can maximize our output, notwithstanding those other tensions. Thank, thank you for that. My time has expired. Thank you for the additional time, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. You're welcome. Uh, and I thank you for your questions. I will set the record straight that it is common practice for every one of our offices that it be open source who works in our offices and that every consular and state department have a website, which is basic transparency, and that on that website, they do put up the hierarchy of who works, but you do not have a website, and so you do not have that level of transparency. I will now recognize Mr. Mills for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And yes, we actually even have websites like LegStorm and others that tell exactly who's in our offices. So it's kind of funny that the uh, appointee does not. Uh, Secretary Kerry, thank you so much for coming here. I hope it wasn't too problematic for your operational team and your private jet to get here. Uh, but I will start with the fact that in an interview in September of 2021, when asked about the importing of solar panels that were built with Uyghur slave labor, slave labor, that the trade-off between climate and human rights, you said it's life is full of tough choices. Do you believe the question of whether to import solar panels built on the backs of Uyghur slaves is such a tough choice? No, of course not. Not only do I not believe it, but I've raised it in my, uh, 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 my meetings uh, over the years, raised it consistently as Secretary of State, as Senator. So you, you didn't... You're, you're I, I don't even know where, where... I don't know what the context is of the conversation you're referring to, but um, Interesting. I'm, I'm making it crystal clear Got it. That, Secretary that Kerry, really uh, you have prioritized rapid deployment of PRC solar panels above the human rights of enslaved Uyghurs, the interests of American manufacturers, and the integrity of the Department of Commerce's investigations. What is the benefit of that? I'm not sure. Can you repeat that? Sure. I said in my statement that you have prioritized rapid deployment of PRC, which is China solar panels, above the human rights of enslaved Uyghurs, the interest of American manufacturing, and the integrity of the Department of Commerce's investigations. Can no, I have, never, I have never, ever prioritized bringing in any solar panel that violates the Uyghur Enforcement Act. Can you tell me exactly so, where solar panels and the raw material sourcing comes from? Uh, where and which panels? Name them. Well, there are three major companies that were bringing in panels at one point in time, but most of those panels, the ones Can you that where those companies are from. One, I think, uh, a couple were from China. One might have been Vietnam, but but it's my understanding, Congress. So, but none none were American, is what you just basically pointed out, right? So it was China and it was Vietnam, meaning that we're prioritizing the idea of ceasing American energy and going after American energy to prioritize what we already know is an adversarial nation. And, I, and I'm tired of hearing no, no, this no, no, no. Actually, idea. It's Sir, I'm talking, please. Yeah. Um, sensory strategic competition. I'm sorry. That if we're talking about strategic competition, we're talking about the fact that American economy, American industrial base, American raw material and supply chain capability and capacity, our own ability to put Americans to work, our own ability to try and drive down inflation. We're actually in a direct economic and resource and cyber warfare with China and have been for 20 plus years. It's been ignored. While China has advanced their Belt and Road Initiative, while they have expanded the Eurasian border, tried to dominate Africa, taken over Oceania, 
blocking off internationally recommended transit corridors for Horn of Africa, Mediterranean Red Sea, Black Sea, Persian Gulf, so they can choke off Western Hemisphere supply chain. And meanwhile, we know that the threat that's going on with Taiwan, we know that China has continued to violate international treaties like the one country, two system framework of Hong Kong that they've exhibited. We know that Chairman Xi wants to basically go ahead and save face for his father's name that was corrupted during the Mao uh, dynasty. So my whole point is, is that if we know all these things and that they're an adversarial nation, why on earth would we try to go ahead and build them economically and not try to go ahead and try and decouple from China as we should be in an effort to go ahead and build American manufacturers and American jobs and American workers and American economy? Well, we're not, we're not <laughs> trying to uh, build them economically, I can assure you of that. Who's their largest trade partner? Uh, let, me, let, me just, let me just finish. America. Yes, but most economists, most investors, uh, most people who have studied this issue very carefully do not believe it is possible to totally decouple from China. It, it absolutely is, sir. And I can well, tell you that if we would utilize things like seabed harvesting for our raw materials, if we would look at the understanding of what we can do as a nation from LNG, from fracking, from our oil and gas. We're doing all those things. I can tell you the biggest thing is we're not going to get away and start having tanks that are EVs we can go ahead and plant on the battlefield our chargers for Tesla prior to us deploying into war. But I'll just finish with this. This solar emergency that we keep talking about and the preemptively directed commerce to suspend tariffs on solar imports from four Southeast Asian countries, Malaysia, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Thailand for the last two years. This is in despite of the fact that the Biden administration's own investigation found that PRC companies to be transshipping through these very countries in a sophisticated effort to evade tariffs. We have done nothing to actually try and combat that, and instead, we've actually gone ahead and increased our trade. This is a China first, America last agenda that you're pushing. I do not agree with the fact that we're not allowing more manufacturing in America to, con to, to continue, and that we're not encouraging that more than trying to continue to trade with what is known not as a competitor, sir, but as an adversary. And with that, I yield back. So uh, can I respond, Mr. Chairman, a little bit? Um, there is nothing in President Biden's policy that is geared to try to assist China in its development, which it has been doing in a number of different ways, some of them in violation of the WTO, some of them not. But the fact is that uh, we had a solar industry. Germany had a solar industry. And China dumped for a number of years, uh, and we lost those industries. Now President Biden's trying to get them back. That is the entire purpose of the Inflation Reduction Act, and it's working. It is creating a new supply chain here in our country. In addition to that, the Uyghur Act is being enforced. It's being enforced, and there are countless uh, panels not coming into our country because the border and customs folks have been enforcing that act. So uh, I just don't agree with your facts, which began with the presentation of one of the most outrageously persistent lies that I hear, which is this private jet. We don't own a private jet. I don't own a private jet. I personally have never owned a private jet. And obviously, it's pretty stupid to talk about coming in a private jet from the State Department up here. It, it just honestly, if that's where you want to go, go there. Believe me. Chair now recognizes you, Mr. Kim for five minutes. Down. Chair now recognizes Mr. Kim. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Secretary Kerry, thanks for coming on over here. And I, I know we've, uh, you've been peppered with a lot of different questions about uh, China on, on a range of different issues. I guess I just want to ask you, what is your agenda? Well, you know, with, with regards to this trip coming up forward in, in, in a couple of days, I think it'd be helpful for this committee to just hear directly from you, not just about all these other issues, but what, what are you trying to achieve? What are you trying to raise? Uh, what are you hoping to focus on? Well, because we've been interrupted uh, several times over the course of the last year, we haven't had as much engagement as, as we did in the last six months, anyway. Uh, but um, what we're trying to achieve now is really to establish some stability, if we can, in the relationship, without conceding anything. There's no concession. I'm not going over with any concessions. 
What we're trying to do is find ways we can cooperate to actually address the crisis. Because China, as the world's second largest economy and as the world's largest emitter, is critical to our being able to solve this problem. Uh, it would be malpractice of the worst order, diplomatic and political and common sense. Are there certain issues that you feel like right now can be places where that conversation is We, we, we hope, that's a good question, Congressman, thank you. Uh, we hope that we can uh, make some progress on a number of areas. Methane is particularly important for our cooperation. Uh, China agreed to have a methane action plan uh, out of our prior talks in Glasgow. And again, in Sharm el-Sheikh, we hope that that is something we can make progress on. We hope we can make progress on the transition away from coal. Coal is the dirtiest fuel in the world. And emissions that are not captured from coal are the worst cause of the warming of the ocean and the torrential downpours that we see now that come because more moisture arises because of the heating of the ocean. 90% of the warming of the earth goes into the ocean. And now we're seeing exactly what happens with these floods as a result of that increased moisture. I mean, there's a clear scientific tracking of relationship mm -hmm. here. What we want to do is find ways to see if China and the United States can advance the cause together for the rest of the world by accelerating rates of doing things, by increasing the uh, deployment of renewables, by uh, improving grid management, uh, there are a host of things that we think uh, are really worthy of conversation. And if we can make some progress on that, we think we can tampen down this edgy sense of competition, which yeah. could lead to a mistake, which takes you to a place you didn't mean to go to. You talked about methane a couple of times. Yeah, we've also talked about COP28 coming up later this year. Um, I guess I just want to get a sense for you. What would success look like at COP28? Or what, what, are, what are you hoping to see come out of that? I think that uh, there are a number of things. First of all, COP28 already requires a, a global stock take. That is a evaluation of how the world is doing with respect to the promises that have already been made. Mm -hmm. Secondly, there will be an adaptation report, which will help to make a judgment about how we can accelerate adaptation for places that are really in jeopardy. Island states, vulnerable nations, uh, they are the ones suffering the most, but they don't contribute to the problem, but they're suffering the most as a result of the problem. And then in addition to that, there is uh, the, the finalization of the fund that was created, the so-called loss and damage fund, which is simply a recognition. It does not have any liability in it, we specifically put phrases in that negate any possibility of liability, but it is there to try to help some of these vulnerable, less developed areas yeah. uh, from where they, from the problems that they're facing. Now, in addition to that, we want to see global raising of ambition. Everybody has to try to reduce emissions faster. We have set a very ambitious goal under President Biden's leadership. We're at 50 to 52 percent reduction in emissions, hopefully. We believe we're on track to be able to do that, even though they've gone up slightly in this past year. Uh, what's happening right now in terms of uh, new technologies coming online, uh, in terms of the reduction of coal, in terms of the capture of emissions and so forth, uh, we're at least uh, able to turn the corner and begin to reduce rather than increase, and we think we can meet the targets that we've set, which can help keep 1.5 degrees as the limit of the warming of the planet. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you. And I will now yield to Mr. Moran for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you said earlier, this is a quote I wrote down when you were answering a question from one of my colleagues. Uh, we have 12 years within which to make decisions to avoid the worst consequences of climate change. Um, in response, in regards to that quote, then my question would be, what is the U.S. doing to force China to reduce its CO2 emissions? Well, uh, the 12 years, first of all, was set by the scientists, not my number, it's their number. They say that's the framework 
Regardless, you adopted that as truth today before the committee. I adopt uh, the best science in the world as a good guidepost for good governance. So, and I if, think that's if, what we need to exercise. Now, if you're the I'm special envoy on behalf of the president working on climate issues, and you take the position that we have 12 years within which to make decisions to avoid the, quote, worst consequences, then what are you doing to force China to reduce its CO2 emissions? Well, I'm going there to start with, but I'm not sure that that presence alone is enough to force them. Uh, but I, we're I certainly that, which is what, which is, the, it's a reasonable question. I mean, you've been asked to do this. I didn't ask you to do it. The president asked you to go abroad and to, to have this conversation with China. And so I want to know, what are we going to do to twist it's, it's the use of the word uh, force. I think that, uh, it's important to have a dialogue about how you can both uh, reach agreement to replace do the word force with influence. What are you going to do to influence China to to reduce its CO2 emissions? Well, we've had very successful rounds of meetings with them and, and have moved significantly. China, let me give you an idea of what China is doing now in response to some of the pressure that I think has, has been evident. What, uh, they are, I want to get real specific uh, about actions you're going to ask them to do. What actions are you going to go to the table? Well, we're looking at the CBAM. To I to told you. This. We are looking very closely at the CBAM, as is Europe and other countries. We're looking at other ways to be able to try. But our, pressure, our, our preference is to have China say, yeah, that makes sense. But China, but China hasn't, because in the past decade, as you know, uh, we've reduced emissions here in the United States, but in the same time frame, China's emissions have increased. All the while, they continue to say, we're working on it. And all the while, you continue to go over there and ask them to work on it, but we have not seen real deliberate action on their part to match the U.S.'s efforts in this regard. Is that correct? We have actually seen some action which isn't evident to everybody because people, they don't advertise it. But I'll tell you what's happening. Let me, let me just answer your question. China is deploying, manufacturing and deploying more renewable energy than all the rest of the world put together. That's what they're doing. China right now has about uh, uh, somewhere in the vicinity of uh, uh, a couple of thousand gigawatts, but they're now going up. And by 2030, our judgment is China may well be around 2,200, 2,400 gigawatts of renewable. The pollution that's coming out of China the, far correct. exceeds. That's exactly why we're working at what we're doing. And you said yourself, quote, earlier, this is a global universal issue, and we, do, we don't want it to become captive to other issues. But I'm curious when you say that, if, there, if you're ignoring these other issues like my colleague brought up here, human rights issues, would you agree that human rights issues are also global universal issues? Absolutely. But you, you want to keep them separate when you're talking to China is what you said earlier. Is that true? What I said is, they're, well, no, we don't, we don't keep them separate in terms of our priorities. No, that's exactly I go what you there said. You said President I Xi go, and President Biden agreed at the outset to separate out the climate issue correct. so it wouldn't get caught up in these other issues. Correct. So are, are you, were you correct? That there? doesn't you mean just, you don't talk about them, well, but it means that they're not going to become showstoppers so that they're playing one off against the other. I'll give you an example. Uh, they, they uh, you know, we don't trade any component of any of those other issues for what we're trying to do on the climate front. On the climate front, we will, we've agreed, we will deal with that. And we have to find a pathway forward. And there are others, the Assistant Secretary of State, the Secretary of State, the, uh, the uh, NSC, who deal directly on those other issues. Okay, we're trying I to do, that you're you having, know what we're trying to do? We're trying to make sure that you don't have to worry that John Kerry is going to give away some right on human rights in order to get what he's trying to get. So I get that. And I presume, so that's I, what I presume that you're going to have conf conferences with your counterparts that are having those discussions on those other issues and that President Biden has said to you and those others, which one is more priority over the other? So my question would be, is human rights the bigger issue? Okay. Is the slave labor coming out of the Uyghur uh, people this a bigger issue? Congressman, this administration is, is capable of keeping change? all its priorities on the table and of treating all of them simultaneously. But we don't have to wrap them up so one becomes hostage to the other. Or you don't make progress. You plan to you hold China accountable if they do not follow through with the activities that you're going to suggest and to reduce their emissions. Because they're, they're able to get ahead of our economy by producing m many more emissions and having less regulatory action on their businesses right. than we are here in the and United States. And we don't States. want that to happen. That is precisely and how are you going to hold them accountable? 
because that's exactly why President Biden has asked us to examine the uh, the countervailing. Uh, I have never measures. seen an examination hold anybody accountable. We need action to hold well, them accountable. Well, that's exactly what's happening. And you've got several senators. You have some in the House. I believe uh, there are a number of House members who are looking at the uh, border adjustment mechanism. I know Senator Coons and some others, and now Senator Whitehouse, have uh, different plans for how to do that. Uh, this is gaining, I think, some steam legislatively because people are frustrated by what is happening. So. Uh, you know, you first got to come up with the legislation, and somehow it's got to pass the U.S. Congress writ large. So hopefully we can get there. We don't legislate China, but we need to hold them accountable. No, but you can legislate a CBAM. Chair now recognizes Ms. Dean for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Mast, Ranking Member Crow. Thank you, Secretary Kerry, uh, for being here and for your decades of varied and rich service to our country. Uh, as you point out, uh, and as the world knows, the climate crisis is a global problem requiring global solutions, uh, international cooperation. So you are extraordinarily well suited uh, from your passion for this, this uh, subject, for your passion for this country and our world, uh, to be in the role you're in. We're lucky to have you. And I thank the administration for, for on day one, returning to the Paris Climate Accord, which the former president in June of 2017 walked away from. Uh, what a shame for our country that that happened. And I really speak to you today, not just as a legislator, but as a mom and a grandmom. I've got four grandchildren, and they're seeing the effects of climate change with extraordinary storms, smoke filling the atmosphere and hurting our eyes. Uh, in August of uh, 2021, a crazy Hurricane Ida came up right through suburban Philadelphia, the five-county area. Massive flooding, tornadoes, unprecedented for our area, suburban Philadelphia, and extraordinary loss and damage. Uh, I want to just draw a contrast because I absolutely share your opening thoughts about the opportunity in this moment the absolute challenge of it, the crisis in front of us on so many fronts, but today we're talking about climate, but the unbelievable opportunity. I have the honor of serving on the Regional Leadership Council. We're working directly with the administration for the Invest in America bills to bring these investments to every single one of our communities. You pointed out the investments, the historic transformational investments through IRA and infrastructure. Could you give us a little more detail the Inflation Reduction Act dollars, those transformational dollars, as well as um, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, and what this massive uh, investment, and I contrast this with the last administration, never got any of these things done, never dealt with climate, just pulls out of the accords. We got massive legislation passed to make a difference for my grandchildren and their children. Can you emphasize some of those investments we need to make? Well, the investments we need to make happily, thank you, Congresswoman, I appreciate the question. Um, the investments uh, that, that need to be made are being made as a consequence of the Inflation Reduction Act. And it's, there's a certain irony in it. The estimates are right now that about $338 billion of, of the targets of that act are, going, are being distributed in what are called red states, and there's about 180 billion that is going to what are called blue states. So the vast largest benefit is going to parts of the country where you have skilled workers who were in, in other forms of energy production who can readily be available and transition into the new technologies, whatever they're going to be, whether it's direct carbon capture or building out a storage capacity. Uh, I mean, frankly, what, what one of the beauties, I think, of that particular piece of legislation is there's no one winner. It doesn't pick a winner. It, it, what it's doing is creating incentives so that people can go out and make their own decision about where they think the best opportunities are going to be. So uh, a lot is happening right now. We have about 2,000 gigawatts of renewable power that is just queued up waiting for approval. 
And what we need to do is find a way to bust that out, get it through the queue and approved, because that's going to generate even that much more energy uh, and clean energy for the country. So that's that, one example of what's happening with it. That, I want to pick up on that irony. It's not lost on any of us where these investments will go. They will go out with equity, not going out following the votes or the lack of votes that came for these massive transformational right. generational changes. Uh, I want to just take you to some of the opening statements, and I wonder what your reaction was. I think at some point someone called you uh, that you were carrying a far-left radical agenda. Uh, I have to admit to you, if anybody thinks it is radical uh, to care about the protection of this planet for future generations, uh, sign me up. It reminds me of Martin Luther King in the letter from Birmingham jail when he was called a radical and an extremist. He said, wasn't Jesus a radical for love? So I embrace the term radical whenever I'm uh, attacked that way when I'm focused on something so worthy. What are your thoughts? Are you embracing some far left radical agenda? Uh, well, thank you uh, for the opportunity to hang myself. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I think I am pursuing common sense uh, for political right, political left, Republican, Democrat, because as I said, uh, what we're looking at is something that is human created. The problem we face right now comes from the way we inadvertently, it's the way the world developed starting in the middle of the 1800s with the Industrial Revolution, and we all accept, we, we've all benefited from it. Americans particularly have had the richest lives on the planet because we have the best health care, we've had so many different pluses that have come with the development we were able to create. Now, we've learned as of 1988, alarm bell, problem. What you have been doing and taking for granted is actually destroying a lot of things on the planet. We lose about 8 million people a year to the quality of air, lack of quality, actually, air pollution. Greenhouse gas gases are pollution. And that pollution is having an impact on the lives of our fellow Americans, negative impact. Uh, it, we're now seeing, because of the warming that comes with the emissions piling up in this you know, level of the atmosphere above the Earth, it prevents the cooling from normally taking place. And so this warming is now totally documented. Everybody knows it's happening. Humans creating it. From the way we propel our cars, light our rooms and factories, uh, heat our homes, that's what it is. It's the emissions. And if we can figure out, you know, so you've sort of got a simple choice here. You either stop making those emissions or you can do something with them that's useful and doesn't harm things. And there is no proof to this date that we have the ability to be able to do that. I so thank you. Chair now recognizes Mr. Perry for five minutes. I thank the Chairman. Thank you, Secretary. In an attempt to get to net zero by 2050, do you support the administration's goal of cutting U.S. emissions in half by 2030? Uh, yes, I do. Secretary, in 1997, the Senate voted 95 to zero, including you and then Senator Biden, in favor of the Bird hagel resolution, which resolved that the U.S. shouldn't cut emissions until China, Mexico, India, Brazil, South Korea, and other devel so-called developing nations cut emissions as well. Do you remember that? I do very, very well, because I was managing it and on since, the floor of the Senate. Since uh, 97, have emissions from China, India, and Mexico all increased? Yes as yeah. they have yeah. from the United States. And, and global and emissions have continued to increase as well, right? Yes. Have any of those countries submitted a credible plan to get to net zero emissions by 2050? Which countries? Let's just go with uh, China, India, or Mexico. No. It seems that, have you abandoned your position that those other nations would cut emissions before Americans would have to make choices between the groceries on their table and paying for, for these policies? I think the reality is that the world changed in that period of time. Let me, let me explain okay, to you. Okay, so, you, know, so you me, voted that way, but, but you But let me explain your... to you the vote, because I did manage this on the floor. And I know exactly what happened, because I'm the one who said to our colleagues, I think everybody ought to vote for this. 
And the reason was that it fundamentally had the message that it's not fair. The one we were talking about earlier with the chairman, it's not fair for us to be reducing and China, which was producing three times more emissions than us, and then producing goods that come into our country from that dirty power, and we have a problem. So we wanted to address that. But we knew not every aspect of that piece of legislation. It's what you, you all call, we all call, a message. It was a message vote. And the vote was clear. We wanted other people to join us in the effort to reduce emissions. Okay, fair enough. That hasn't happened sufficiently. It hasn't happened sufficiently. No. sufficiently. Now, Secretary, in 2015 at the Paris Climate Conference, you said that if all industrial nations go to zero emissions, it wouldn't be enough. And then at the White House's Climate Day in January of 21, you said almost 90% of the planet's emissions come from outside the U.S. We could go to zero tomorrow, and the problem isn't, isn't solved. And in April... 21, you told the Washington Post that even the U.S. and China going to zero emissions tomorrow won't solve the climate's problem. Then in April of 21, you said that global net zero is not enough and that CO2 must be removed from the atmosphere. How much is the correct amount of CO2? Let me explain to you, if I can, so you understand exactly what I said. It, it, it's close, but it's not quite exactly what I was saying. Can you what just I'm tell saying, me what let, the let me tell you what I'm saying. Is. I'm going to tell you what the correct. Here's how, how it works. Because we have put, I would forget the exact number of tons, millions of tons of CO2 and other greenhouse gases are now in the atmosphere. They're there. And every day we're adding more. And so every day the heat is going up and we have to figure out how we're going to, you know, tame the, the monster here. The only way to do that is to reduce emissions on an ongoing basis to get control on the current level of emissions that we have created. But then, what is then but, but what actually is the correct, suck? Sir, with all due respect, to, you've been through this before. Finish. What is the correct amount? I don't want to spend a bunch of time about a history lesson about things that people don't care about. What well, changes every what, day? I don't. The, I can't tell you exactly correct what amount it is. Change it's in the, there, yes, so, it does. So, Secretary, you probably know that for approximately. 200 million years. What's the, what's the parts per million now? About 400, right? Can we it's agree on that? It's over 400. All right. It's about, about 200 million years. 2,000 parts per million. Did Mother Nature get it wrong for 200 million years? Here's the difference, Congressman. The difference is, yes, there were, ma there were periods which all scientists, all the scientists who deal with climate acknowledge that there have been moments on the planet, which is billions of years old, in which there were greater heat and there was greater tell me the difference dioxide. quickly i've got a the little difference is time. human beings are creating okay so this. that's the difference so human beings are we about are creating hundred thousand years old but but during these periods of time where it was two thousand parts per million life existed as a matter of fact not we're in not the, one people of the lowest not, periods. not human beings walking around we're in no. one of the lowest periods of carbon in the atmosphere in not only recorded history, in the history of life existing on the planet. In December of 2022, you told the Washington Post we need to remove 1.6 trillion tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere via direct air capture. The cost for that is about $1,000 per ton or $1.6 quadrillion dollars. Now, I said you said you didn't know, but since 2015, since the last El Nino, about 500 billion tons have been have been emitted into the atmosphere. During that same period of time, 2015, if you look at the temperature graph, this is from NOAA. The temperature has gone down. Show the next slide. This is from NASA satellite data. Temperature has gone down. You want to have the, uh, have, uh, the American taxpayers, my constituents that are having a hard time afford their groceries, pay for a car, buy a new home, spend $1.6 quadrillion dollars to fix a problem that A, doesn't exist, and as a matter of fact, you might be exacerbating because it's unknown. It is unknown at this time the low level that of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that might actually destroy life because plant life <clears throat> all depends. As you know, Secretary, plant life all depends on CO2, and when we kill it, then we're done too. I yield the balance. Congressman, let me just say that uh, I don't agree with what you're saying out there for any number of reasons. I don't have time to go into all of them now, but I'll just tell you point blank that the difference between the periods you're looking at in terms of heat, et cetera, and human, human input is night and day. 
number one. Number two, why do you think 195 countries in the world, their prime ministers, their presidents. Because they're grifting they're, like you are, sir. <laughs> this, uh, that's a pretty shocking statement, that you believe that all the scientists in the world are grifters, honestly. Not all scientists agree with you, Mr. Sutter. 98% of all the scientists in the world. Science isn't yeah. about agreement. It's not about consensus. You know that. Well, Chair now recognizes Ms. Sherfulis McCormick for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to start off by saying that representing Fort Lauderdale, who just experienced over a hundred, a thousand year, um, years of flooding that we've never seen before, that we most certainly know that climate change is real and we're feeling the effects. And we understand that the work that you're doing, Secretary, is very important and we thank you for being here. My first question is, earlier this year, I had the privilege of accompanying Vice President Harris to Africa to build on the commitments made during the U.S. Africa Leadership Summit last December. During her travels, the Vice President announced over $7 billion in private sector and U.S. government commitments to promote climate resilience, adaptation, and mitigation across Africa. Last month, Beijing announced a major grant to offer South Africa with solar panels and gen generators. To what extent is it essential to improve our climate support of Africa to compete with China? You know, I, I personally, I'm speaking personally on this, I, I, I don't think that the choice we make with respect to Africa ought to be just based on what, what, what China's doing. It ought to be based on what we ought to be doing and what all of us ought to be doing. Africa, I mean, there are 48 sub-Saharan African countries, 48, that equals 0.55% of emissions. They're not causing this problem. But 17 of the top 20 impacted nations by climate are in Africa. Now, if we don't stop and think about that in terms of global responsibility and global politics, we're really missing something. And right now, I find the tensions between global north and global south are growing. And food production in Africa is threatened. Water is threatened in South Central Asia and Africa, various places. Uh, and, and this is why the congressman who was speaking earlier about showing on his charts, uh, you know, there's only one group of people in the, in the world that I know of who are busy trying to tell people that this is not happening and it's fake and somehow we're missing something. Only one group of people, and they're here in Washington, and some of them spread around the country. The fact is that all around the world, smart people, people who lead countries, who are responsible for the lives of millions of peoples, just like, like you are and we are, are responding to the clearly defined crisis of climate. So I, I think we have to look at this beyond uh, beyond uh, China, I think we have to look at this in the context of what's our responsibility uh, to the future and what's our responsibility to our fellow human beings and, and how do we deal with a crisis that has been brilliantly described over these last 30 years or more, where everything predicted mm -hmm. is happening, only it's happening faster and bigger than it was predicted. My second question is, according to the Biden-Harris administration, national security strategy, no region impacts the United States more directly than the Western Hemisphere. In June, Haiti experienced intense flash flooding, rock slides, and landslides that destroyed thousands of homes and killed over 50 people, combined with the ongoing humanitarian crisis and substantial gang violence. Many Haitians are looking to flee the country. Secretary Kerry, as the Biden administration focuses on the root cause of migration, can you describe how taking action on climate crisis can help bring stability to our nations and other nations where their citizens are looking to migrate? Thank you so much for that thoughtful question, and it's really a major, major problem because there are now climate refugees already today who are moving across borders and looking for different places to live. Some of the people, not all of them, but some of the folks coming from, South, from Central America and South America fit into that category. Uh, there are folks who used to farm, who now find they can't farm the products, the, 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 the goods that they were farming, and so they're migrating. And one of the things that we learned during the course of the war in Syria was a million people moved into Damascus, which greatly complicated the war, but then they began to migrate 
uh, and became a political tool, actually, and were sort of pushed to migrate into Europe and had a profound impact, a negative one, on the, the politics of, of Europe as a result. So this is a major issue, and it's one we have to really pay attention to. Secretary, um, I want to ask you one question before we end, which is imperative. In April, Fort Lauderdale, which is in my district, witnessed unprecedented flash flood caused by the highest record rainfall in one single day. The flooding resulted in significant property damage, the closure of the airport, and shortages of gas all across South Florida. Recently, ocean temperatures in Florida Keys soared to 96 degrees, highlighting the impact of the rising temperatures on the region's marine ecosystem. Can you explain to us why this is happening and what is causing causing the increased weather and extreme weather since there are people who don't believe in climate change. Well, thank you again. Um, I just might point out that I just saw this article this morning that uh, farmers insurance has pulled out of Florida, affecting 100,000 policyholders. And the reason the insurance company has pulled out is because this, this unprecedented change in weather patterns, et cetera, has affected their ability to be able to make policies and for people to be able to afford those policies under the current circumstances. This has been a predicted uh, happening. I mean, everybody's been talking about the potential impact on insurance, and now it is happening in various parts of the world. So, uh, I mean, the, the reason, as I said earlier, 90% of the heating of the planet, which is documented, goes into the ocean. And that warming of the ocean then increases the moisture that rises from the ocean and travels around the planet with the planetary winds. And, and when it decides to fall in rainfall, it goes into the ocean. It, 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 uh, it, it is in much larger amounts than ever before because of the increase of the moisture. It's changed wind patterns and weather patterns, and the heating uh, has other ancillary effects. Chair now recognizes Mr. Issa for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sir Secretary, uh, it's, it's a pleasure seeing you. It's a pleasure knowing that uh, you're in this administration. Uh, and, and I mean that quite sincerely. Uh, I'm, I'm often disappointed in this administration. I'm not necessarily in lockstep with all of your opinions, but uh, you and I go back a long way of, of trying to do the right thing. I, uh, I want, first of all, I wanted to get a figure you gave that I may have miswritten. You predicted, you didn't give the, the amount they have today, but you predicted 2,200 gigawatts in China by 2030. Is that accurate? That's what our current uh, estimates are showing. This comes from a number of different sources. But it could be more, it could be less. And, but today, how many gig do they have, what roughly? Let me get back to you. I was actually talking with folks about that yesterday, and I couldn't get a pin down, but I'll come back to you with a number. OK, yeah, it would be good for me to have that, because uh, that's a lofty goal. But as you and I know, both know, you go to China, you see a a lot of amazing, uh, you know, cranes. But then when you go back, you see the cranes in the same position. So it doesn't always mean that they're doing what they say they're going to do. Um, in 2021, you said that, uh, uh, you told this committee that trusting China and climate change promises would be stupid and malpractice. Uh, without directly using that quote again, would you generally agree that it still would be malpractice? I think trusting a lot of the players who've been involved in this, uh, in government and also private sector, is not the smartest thing in the world because we've been burned. Now, China is a, uh, a country that buys all of the above, no question at all. They buy a massive amount of ours and the rest of the world's coal. They're increasing their, their coal. They're buying natural gas. They're putting in nuclear. And as you said, they're, they're doing uh, some work, considerable work in the photovoltaic that they produce. Um, but India has a tendency to continue burning both dung and coal. Uh, you're going to China, uh, but we had the, uh, the head you know, of, of India here for a joint session just recently. And uh, he said a lot of great things, but he didn't say 
we're going to buy natural gas or do other incremental things to reduce the carbon footprint. Are we dealing with two problems, a China that it's malpractice to believe that they'll do what they say they'll do, and an India that constantly seems to say they're too poor to do what they should do to do the, any part of climate change reduction? Well, interestingly, Congressman, and thank you for your comments. We have enjoyed working together on a number of things. Um, uh, India is, has set a very lofty goal of trying to uh, deploy 500 gigawatts of renewable energy by 2030. That's their goal. <coughs> and if India could succeed in doing that, India would be in compliance with the effort to keep, that would be a 1.5 degree plan. That, that would be really and, and I understand that, Mr. Secretary, but if, if, for example, if India had simply switched its coal production to, uh, to natural gas, they would have reduced more than that amount, and they would have done so at a lower cost. So isn't it fair to say that India sets lofty goals like China, but w actions speak louder than word so far they're actually- Well, India is deploying. They're deploying. Their hope is to deploy, and their hope is to close coal. Now, they can't afford. They, they don't have LNG, uh, and they- Well, they don't have LNG because they haven't built the plants or signed the contracts. Well, that is true. But on the other hand, they can't afford to do that on their own. They weren't able to at that point in time. India is growing now. Its economy is growing. Uh, the visit here produced some significant joint initiatives going forward. I am actually going to India uh, before the end of this month uh, to follow up on the conversations we had uh, with, with both the Prime Minister being here, but also before that with some of his other... Okay, uh, and if teams. I can squeeze in one more quick question. Uh, you know, you're going to meet with, uh, in China with a number of, of leaders, but uh, the president called Xi Jinping, called him a dictator. Do you believe he wields the power of a dictator today in China, meaning is his ability to, is similar to Putin's ability to affect what he says he will do such that if he makes a promise, he can keep it? There, there's no question at all that uh, President Xi is the major decider uh, of uh, of the direction and of the policies of Is he, China. in fact, effectively a dictator? Well, I'm not, you know, I don't think it's useful to get into, I don't, I'm not going to get into. But he does uh, wield the power of. He a, wields a enormous power as the, as the leader of China, absolutely. And, and everybody understands that. But I don't, you know, I, I, it doesn't. Do you, do you wish the president had used another word? No, I'm, I don't even, I just, frankly, all of that is sort of like water off the duck's back, and I don't think we ought to get tangled up in, you know, labels and names and whatever. What we ought to do is look at the heart of what we're trying to do. President Biden actually has a very good relationship with President Xi, and President Xi, vice versa. I think he honors the relationship he has with, with President Biden. And I, and I think in Secretary Blinken's visit to China, and subsequently in Janet Yellen's visit with China, where you saw uh, in her own statements publicly and assessments, there was frank conversation. But the effort is well underway now to try to stabilize and, and avoid uh, conflict by virtue of unforeseen consequences Ms. or mistakes. Chair now recognizes. Mr. Chairman, can I just ask one follow-up? It doesn't require, but would you commit when you have had those meetings with India and China to in writing or in some other way, report back to us so we have an update on the Sure, they yeah, happy to. I thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Issa. Chair now recognizes Ms. Titus for five minutes. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when you go towards the end, there are not many questions left to ask, but you have the luxury of having heard everything gone before and kind of reached some conclusions. One thing I heard was my colleague on the other side called the secretary, uh, most of the scientists in the world, and the heads of 195 countries who belong to the UN climate agreement, grifters. Now, that's something that should be taken down, but since he's gone in his typical hit-and-run fashion, it wouldn't be much point. Now, the arguments that I've heard from both sides, on the other side of the aisle we hear, you can't make China do anything. You can't force China to do anything. You can't 
impose any restrictions on China. Therefore, we shouldn't be doing anything in the United States. On the other hand, when you're getting ready to go to China and try to negotiate something or make some points or try to influence their decision, they don't want you to go. They think that's not a good idea. Also, uh, we hear that this, you have a pro-China, not a pro-American approach, and you are not helping U.S. business and workers. On the other hand, these people who are saying this voted against the Inflation Reduction Act, which made a big investment in manufacturing and workers and solar energy panels that we don't have to get from the Uyghurs, but can be made here. Speaking of the Uyghurs, there's a real now sudden interest in human rights of the Uyghurs, but it doesn't bother them too much to deal with Saudi Arabia when it comes to these issues. Also, we know that this is a world issue. Climate change affects everything from demographics to politics to e economics, and yet we're not looking at the rest of the world. It's as though only the U.S. and China exist on the globe. So I would ask you, Mr. Secretary, because climate change and energy policy is so pervasive in everything we do, it's not just about dealing with the next storm or the next wildfire. It has so much of an impact on peacekeeping, on development of foreign countries, on our role internationally. Uh, are, are what you're hearing from the other side diminishing our influence, uh, hurting our role as we try to kind of move back into being an uh, international leader, kind of uh, upsetting some of our NATO relations because of what Europe is doing and what we're not? Uh, are the cuts in the budget going to make a difference because we can't now invest what the president would like to see us do to help the rest of the world with these global uh, problems. Would you just address that sort of thing for us? Well, Congresswoman, thank you very much. Uh, let me just say, I, uh, I've got the figures delivered to me here, if I take 15 seconds on this. China, by uh, according to the International Energy Agency, by 2030, China will have somewhere between 3,000 and 4,000 gigawatts of renewable energy. Uh, that's by fathoms larger than any other country in the planet. Uh, and so they're moving very aggressively in that regard. With respect to the, the look, people really do count on America for a lot of things in the world. And I think everyone should be extraordinarily proud of, of, of our history of doing things. We're the largest humanitarian donor in the world. And you look at what we've done with AIDS in Africa or Ebola or, you know, through various uh, uh, counterterrorism efforts, other things. Uh, but we also, for a long period of time, projected, uh, and this is sort of the soft power projection, but we also, you know, we helped people develop. We helped people do more. That's been retreating in the last years. We're now giving less than a lot of other countries are doing in order to help, particularly on climate. Uh, and uh, I think it does have an impact. I think that people ask questions. I certainly hear these questions. Why aren't you doing that? Why aren't you more present? Why aren't you? Look at who's giving us help here and so forth. So I think that um, you, know, you can't just sit there anywhere and wish that things are going to be as they have been historically. You have to invest in it. You have to actually proactively have people on the ground. You have to build relationships. You have to do things that uh, uh, people see you doing, not just on an economic competitive basis, but because it's the right thing to do. And I think we've uh, fallen a little behind on that. I know President Biden feels very strongly about living up to our commitments and our, uh, our uh, Values. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Titus. Chair now recognizes Mr. Waltz for five minutes. Mr. Secretary, uh, in, in exchange with Mr. Mills, you uh, just testified under oath that you never owned a private jet. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter into the record an uh, article here from February 15th of 2000, 2023 
the, the John Kerry family private jet was sold shortly after accusations of climate hypocrisy. Uh, Mr. Secretary, do you stand by that testimony Not that you've never I, owned or I personally, your family? I by your family. personally, yes. My wife owned a plane and sold the you plane. You flew on That's that plane. Been, uh, not in a number of years, and but I have flown on it, sure. And this article is not then inaccurate, that your family owned a plane, you flew on a plane. There, my, Mr. Wife Secretary, owned, Mr. Secretary, my wife owned here's a plane. The, here's the issue. Yeah. This isn't some kind of partisan gotcha. When we are asking Americans to make serious sacrifices as we transition for the common good, and your family and or yourself are flying around on private jets, that smacks of hypocrisy. It actually hurts your cause, Mr. Secretary, but I'll, I'll move on. But, I just but want to know sir, from a record sir, standpoint. Afford me the, the right, at least, to set the record straight here. I do not fly on a private jet. Uh, I, do, I do not fly. I fly commercially. Have on you flown all on of a private jet since you've taken this position? Just, just let, me, let me just finish. I have flown five times in the last two and a half years on Mill Air, which you also fly on, sure. and or some of you who travel fly on, five times. Otherwise, all of my trips are commercial Have airlines. you flown on a private jet in a personal or official capacity since you've taken this position? Possibly once. I, I don't, I think, I just don't, I'm, I'm trying to think. Of I, I think you need to take the broader point of how this appears to the American people no, as we're asking them to take that. that. Let me tell you why. Mr. I, you, you we're know, not asking you know Americans, testimonies. we're not asking Americans not to fly. You know. You're, you're trying to create an unequal thing. We're not no, saying we're don't fly. No, we're asking you to lead by example, Mr. Secretary. That's what we're at. You which is why I fly commercially. By example. Which is why Mr. I fly In commercial. that vein, does your office uh, or the State Department keep a record of your official travel and scheduled meetings? Of course. Uh, does that include the individuals you're scheduled to meet with? Uh, I, can, you provide the, can you provide those records to Congress? Will you provide those records to Congress? Of who I've met with? Uh, your official travel. Your official travel, taxpayer-funded, sure. while in this position. Sure, happy to do so. Thank you. I appreciate that uh, commitment. Switching. Uh, topics here uh, to some of the other diplomacy you've uh, you've conducted in twenty in a twenty eighteen interview, you uh, admitted to speaking with Iranian Foreign Minister Zarif quote three or four times from the start of the previous administration. How many times did you speak with the Foreign Minister, the Iranian Foreign Minister Zarif, during the last administration? I, I, and, and I'll enter into the record, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, that, objection. that three or four times. So let's take that at face value. Uh, did you communicate with him using Signal, WhatsApp, Telegram, no, any other? I, I, I don't recall how I communicated with him. I met him formally in the course of international, specifically I think it was at UNGA in New York, I saw him in Munich at the Munich Security Conference, which he was invited to. According to, I leaked, saw him. According to leaked audio uh, provided by the New York Times, Zarif said you told him that Israel attacked Iranian assets in Syria at least, quote, at least 200 times, and Zarif was surprised you would reveal such sensitive information. Un now, you know, that was according to leaked audio. Now under oath, do you stand by your previous denial that that ever happened? I absolutely stand. I, we, I, on the day that that report came out, we made it crystal clear in, in, in a release that we put out that that never took place. I, it was at a time when there was public discussion of those attacks. There were, there, it, was a public, it was in public circulation. Now, I don't know what he's confusing or what he did, but I can tell you that I never had that conversation, and I can tell you that in five years running one of the largest prosecutor's offices in America, in two years as lieutenant governor, in 28 years in the Senate, as a member of the this is, Intelligence this is why Committee, I'm, as a this is why I'm Secretary going. I only have a State, few seconds left. Nobody ever Secretary. questioned. This is why I'm raising that issue. Uh, it, do, would you find it appropriate if a former Trump administration official traveled around and talked to the same officials you are and said, you don't have to abide by these agreements. Hold fast till 2024. A new regime or a new administration may be coming in and therefore undermining 
current administration diplomacy. No, Would I, you find that appropriate? I'm not going to speak to any hypotheticals, but I can tell you I never engaged in that. Shadow diplomacy activity. undermines American goals. Shadow diplomacy, depending on what involves. Shadow diplomacy has also saved us from a war. If you look at 1963 with, Jack, uh, with uh, uh, the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, it was behind the scenes, back Mr. channel. Mr. Secretary, I would, I, would, I would posture that your shadow diplomacy now has us on the verge I wasn't of conducting shadow diplomacy. Weapon. I was at a security conference. That is now exploding as they race towards full enrichment from 20 percent to 60 percent uh, on the verge of having a nuclear weapon and a nuclear arms race uh, in the Middle East. And, and the reason that has happened is that Donald Americans, Trump pulled out of the agreement. we don't other administrations. The reason that happened, my friend, is because Donald Trump pulled out of that agreement. There was no way they could have had a nuclear weapon under the agreement that existed. And even in Israel, the security establishment of Israel believed that agreement had done the job. It, you know, President Trump just pulled out. Chair now recognizes Mr. Schneider for five minutes. Thank you. And, um, Special Envoy, Secretary Kerry, uh, thank you for your time today. Earlier we had, had an exchange that um, I guess I can only describe as, as childish, but I thought I would engage a little bit on, on the science. Um, how old is the Earth? I, I don't remember how many billions. But four and a half. I'll, I'll answer. It's four and a half billion years, or in another way of looking at it, 4,500,000 millennium. Uh, and I used to, with my kids, walk through an exercise if the Earth was a year old where things play. And, and just some of the numbers on that, if, if the Earth was a year old and, and, and formed in January 1st, it would be mid-February when life arose on Earth. It would be sometime in mid-November where the fish started swimming in the oceans. The dinosaurs would have gone extinct around Christmas, and all of human existence would have been captured in the last hour of the last day of the year. So this idea of, of um, Comparing numbers from long ago, human existence is a relatively very short period of Earth's existence. Um, the other thing in this, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Secretary, just to state the obvious, is there a difference between life existing on Earth and civilization thriving on Earth? Sure. And is what we're talking about addressing climate change, making sure we're doing everything we can to ensure that civilization, society, America continues to thrive on Earth. Indeed. Okay. Um, just another statistic I'll point out. 40% of all people on Earth live within 100 kilometers or 62 miles of a coast. In the United States, that number is 50% of all Americans live within 50 miles of the coast. And in some of the notes in preparing for this last night, I, I read that um, the first experience of climate change is oftentimes with water, whether it's too much or too little. I think that is uh, one of the key things we face. It's our biggest threat to our nation, climate change is, to our way of life, to world, to the civilization, and halting the displacement, instability, and myriad of other consequences, I think is the greatest challenge, or one of the greatest challenges we face. So thank you for your leadership, leadership in, in addressing this. And I know in Congress, last Congress, we passed the bipartisan infrastructure and Jobs Act. We passed the Inflation Reduction Act, which is being accorded as the greatest to date investment. And one of the pieces of that that I'm very proud of was the work we're doing on sustainable aviation fuel. We have to eliminate uh, or reduce greenhouse emissions every way we can. We can electrify, electrify our ground fleet. Our air fleet will be something different. Um, Secretary, uh, can you talk about how we're working with our friends as well as our, our adversaries or competitors to ensure that we're doing everything we can to reduce greenhouse emissions for the long term. Well, Congressman, thank you. The, the, I mean, obviously, the entire UN process is geared to bring people together around a common goal. And that goal is to try to keep the Earth's temperature increase limited to 1.5 degrees. Why 1.5 degrees? Because, again, the scientists have running all the models, a myriad of models, by the way, which show uh, what the damage is to Earth at certain levels of temperature. And so uh, that is our goal. And the only way to achieve that goal is by coming together on a multinational basis in order to negotiate some common sense approach 
as to how we're going to deal with this. Now, 20 countries, the 20 largest economies on the planet, equal, you know, shy of 80% of all the emissions. 20 countries are the principal cause of what is happening today. 10 of those countries or so have all agreed to plans to try to reduce emissions to get, to keep the 1.5. We're still working with other countries to empower them to be able to do that. If a country is entirely dependent on coal today, they're not going to shut their economy down overnight. So we've got to try to find a way in common enterprise for all of our lives, for, 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 for life on the planet, to help some of those countries to be able to make that transition. And we're getting a little stuck there because some people just don't want to do that. So, and I just want to reclaim my time to make two last points. But one, the, world, the United States can't solve this problem alone. Correct. To work with the world, but the world can't do it with the United States. But to my colleagues on the other side, we're talking about the sacrifices people are being asked to make to address climate change. I would argue that the costs we're putting on people by not addressing are far greater. Food will cost more as you touched on already. Insurance either costs more or is completely unavailable for people living in states. Cleaning up after major extreme weather events, from hurricanes, tornadoes, fires, droughts, every one of these is putting an economic burden on communities across the nation and across the world. And if we don't act now, if we don't lead, it's only going to get worse. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes Mr. Burchett. Thank you, Mr. Rodman. Chairman. Secretary Kerry, thank you for being here. Um, sir, you're, you're unelected and you're non-Senate confirmed bureaucrat, basically. Um, can you tell me what the cost of some of these climate agreements that you've gotten the American taxpayer in, how much is it going to cost them? Well, uh, Congressman, uh, uh, God, Just in dollars. the last thing I think I ever wanted to be in life was called bureaucrat, but, uh, well, we are all are, so. You know, um, well, speaking I don't myself. trust government. <laughs> I am the government, so. Uh, let me just say that uh, uh, the uh, the cost. Uh, you know, we all committed uh, internationally. The world committed to put a hundred billion dollars into a fund uh, that would help these other less developed countries be able to transition. Uh, we've never actually met that full hundred. Uh, we've made some commitments. I, I mean, I can't run through them all. There are a lot of different bits and pieces to it. But by and large, uh, we're seeing many of those things repay themselves many times over because of the transformation of our economy. And uh, but, but can you just tell me how much we, how much it's going to cost us? Is there surely some economic? Well, the the, the UN finance. Sand? You're right, and and sir, the 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 UN finance analysis suggests that it will cost trillions of dollars, maybe two and a half to four and a half trillion a year between now and 2050 to actually affect the full transition to a clean energy economy. But that's not spending. Most of that is calculating private sector funding that will invest in these new technologies and in these new economic opportunities. For instance, uh, we have to build out a grid, competent grid with smart grid so we can balance the distribution of energy in yes, certain sir, places. But, but you understand, though, when they invest, I mean, it just this money just doesn't appear. No, I mean, you're absolutely charge correct. Us, you know, I was always in the state legislature, and somebody said, well, let's just put another nickel on a can of beer. And I was like, well, you know, they're just going to pass that on to to, every, to your constituents. So, I mean, I, I, I hope you understand. Let me move on a little bit. Um, can you explain why you and other members of the U.S. delegation to the United Nations Climate Conference in 2021 and 2022 did not, did not follow the President's direction to track your carbon emissions? Yes, uh, it's unfortunate, but there is, <laughs> they ran into problems, uh, apparently, in how it could get measured, how it gets accrued. Uh, it should be done, and we're trying to get people to sort of bear down. Some of those bureaucrats? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Um, All right. You, um, you've also agreed that countries need to pay poor and developing countries for loss and damage due to climate change. Why do the good folks in East Tennessee that work very hard for their dollars need to pay for a flood in Africa or South Asia? 
Well, we're not specifically paying for a flood in South Africa, though sometimes money may go to something like that. But the United States, as I said, is proudly the largest humanitarian donor in the world. And Republican and Democrat administrations alike have historically, uh, I mean, look at what, uh, you know, President George W. Bush put significant amount of money into the AIDS program in Africa. Uh, Ronald Reagan put significant amounts of money into denuclearizing and other things. I mean, we try to help the world. And you all, as the elected officials, have to balance to what degree, what's that amount going to be? And for what it's specifically going to go? But I think our country is enriched and, and uh, that our civilization is better for the fact that we do try to help people out in other places when they're in trouble. In Pakistan, when 30 million people were dislocated last year in an unprecedented flood, uh, we, we put, uh, I think, uh, you know, a few million dollars, 100 million, I think it was ultimately, to help them recover. Under let, let me get on something else. Mr. Secretary, I apologize to you, but That's all right. we, we've said here that China is considered a developing country. That can be left for later debate. But how many American tax dollars do you intend to pay the Chinese Communist Party for climate change? None. We're not paying them for that, and I don't think there's been one bilateral disbursement of money to China since 2018 when President Trump was President of the United States. Right. But the Biden administration has put zero into that. Zero. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Burchett. Chair now recognizes Mr. Keating for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for allowing me to wave on to this uh, subcommittee on this important hearing today. Thank you, uh, to Secretary Kerry, for being here. Uh, your experience is uh, uh, well known. Uh, uh, you've been in the executive branch uh, at state government level. You've been uh, in the Senate and the legislative sector for 28 years and Secretary of State. Um, and I think perhaps in this morning's testimony, uh, what we heard is a reflection of that to an extent, that, that the questions posed to you in your official capacity really are in the uh, province of the Secretary of State of the United States, or some of the solutions are found in the legislative side in the House or the Senate, uh, and you've, uh, you're here uh, as the envoy. You're here because there's an important new position that was created, because if you look at the importance of climate change right now, uh, it's clear. Uh, it's, it touches everything. If you were doing it in legislative committees, you could be easily testifying in front of the Armed Services Committee or the Intel Committee or Agriculture Committee or Energy and Commerce or Homeland or Appropriations. Uh, if you were dealing with cabinet responsibility, you could go through the whole specter of the President's cabinet and find how climate change is a directly affected an important piece of their function. Uh, so uh, I think given your background, uh, our government is well served uh, by having you in this role uh, of envoy, bringing together uh, all these fragments into one important uh, position. Uh, and I thank you for that. Uh, but I want to give you the opportunity this morning, and as I'm at the last of the queue here, uh, mercifully you might be thinking, but uh, as I'm last in the queue, or pretty close, uh, I'll say this, I just want to give you the chance. We talked about what the past has been, some people going back to creation. Uh, we've talked about uh, the near-term uh, effects of what we're dealing with, the current effects of what we're doing. But you know, given the importance of dealing with this issue uh, existentially, uh, given the fact that uh, scarcity of water creates wars, famine creates migration, uh, everything that we have and the imminence of uh, things getting worse. Could you take a few moments and just share some of the discussions you've had and the knowledge you've had uh, on what the future is going to look like more concretely, not just deadlines for dates, but this is real stuff. Uh, this is a real, uh, there's a real urgency that surrounds this. And can you take a few minutes on, on those matters of how this is going to affect the lives of everyone on this planet, how it's going to affect all those areas, and, and just uh, share with us some of the things you've uh, learned talking with others around the world. 
Well, thank you, Congressman. Um, obviously, um, we're already seeing ways in which it's going to affect people. Um, we've had increasing, every year, increasing storm intensity, storm damage. We're spending billions, literally, actually trillion. We had a trillion in damages, I think it was over the last 10 years. Uh, and, and that's money so thrown away in a sense. No, not that it's inappropriate. We should be helping people afterwards. But wouldn't it make a lot more sense if we were avoiding that damage in the first place or minimizing it? And, and you ask the question, what's it going to look like? Uh, that depends on what we decide to do. It's very obvious that there are huge threats here. Uh, literally, food production for an entire continent could implode. Water is already diminishing. Last year, the Rhine River was down to inches. They had to stop navigation on the river because of it. You're seeing glaciers that are now absolutely predictable as to when they will be completely gone. And, and at the rate the ice is melting in the north and south, of Antarctica and Antarctica, um, there are dire predictions now about how that's moved forward by about 30 years at the pace at which the, the, it is vanishing. Uh, and parts of the Earth are warming much faster than other parts of the Earth. The Arctic, for instance, is warming four times faster than the rest of the Earth. Other places are. We're hitting heat levels in places that have never been lived by human beings on a regular basis. So, you know, what is the good life going to look like in the future? I'm an optimist. I'm genuinely an optimist about this. I'm watching what is now happening because of the Inflation Reduction Act. I'm seeing new processes, new seriousness of purpose among people who up until now never thought they had to be serious. So I'm, I, I have a sense that if we could come together and continue to accelerate the reduction of these emissions, we have an incredibly bright energy future staring us in the face. We can have clean energy. We can have energy that, if not renewable, is still clean in, in nuclear or whichever. You know, I look at the U.S. Navy. We've had ships that are nuclear, a small nuclear plant that have never had a sailor killed or lost or an accident, never had a spill. We know how to do this. We're just not choosing to do many of the things that are available to us to be able to do. So I, I, I think the, there's a huge, exciting set of possibilities for what will happen in this new economy that is going to develop. And it is going to develop because I see the most serious of our entrepreneurs, the most successful of our entrepreneurs, the best of our financiers, all of them are now seized by this issue and they're out there trying to push new processes, new technologies, new possibilities. And if we do what historically we humans have done, uh, we're going to hopefully adapt and, and make the right choices. Well, Chair now recognizes. With that optimist note, I yield back. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Mr. Smith. Thank you five. very much. Uh, Mr. Secretary, welcome. It's great to see you again. Let me just say at the outset how grateful I was when you were Secretary of State and um, legislation that I had introduced to help um, end the practice of child um, abduction. Uh, the bill passed twice. I named it after Sean and David Goldman. Sean was the a young man who was abducted to Brazil. Uh, you changed the policy of the Obama administration because before that they were against it. It sat in the Senate for five years having sent it over uh, several times, uh, and I want to thank you for that. I had an oversight hearing on it just the other day uh, in my committee, the Human Rights Committee, and uh, we are mitigating the number of child abductions that are occurring and helping to bring people back. So thank you so much. It was your change of heart, not you, but the change within the administration that made that happen. So I'm very, very grateful. I would like to ask you um, if you could. You know, I had a hearing uh, last July. I've chaired 79 congressional hearings on human rights abuse in China. My most recent was yesterday. I chaired the China Commission. We had Enes Freedom, who used to play for the Celtics, uh, was fired because he wore free the Uyghurs on his, on his shoes. He was fired because of that. And as a result, the NBA, and I think in a cowardly way, has told everybody in the NBA, just shut up, say nothing about human rights in China. Uh, and his testimony yesterday was absolutely compelling. And we're going to do a follow-up. We've invited or are inviting the NBA to come to that hearing. But last July, I chaired a hearing uh, on the Lantos Commission because we were out of power as Republicans. So Lantos, we could call hearings. Uh, it was on the exploitation of children and adults 
in the Democratic Republic of Congo who are mining cobalt and soon will be mining lithium. We found out, and I've raised this issue before, but the hearing just was a, you know, a catalyst for we need to do more on this. Uh, something on the order of 40,000 children are in these artisanal mines. They're dying. They're getting sick. Um, there's cave-ins. They're, they're inhaling all kinds of, of debris without proper. And who, run, who runs it all? The Chinese Communist Party. They own just about every mine there. All of the finished product, not finished, but the, the mined product of cobalt is sent to China for processing. And then it goes into EVs um, by way of the batteries. And it seems to me that no, where, no matter where anybody comes down on the, the advisability of having more electric vehicles, it should not be on the backs of African children, uh, be they in DR Congo or anywhere else. And 70% of all the cobalt, as you know, does come from the DR Congo. Uh, I introduced a bill, H.R. 4443, uh, that would look to enforce the Tariff Act, uh, Sections 307, and require an all-out effort to try to protect those children and those adults uh, from this egregious human rights practice by the Chinese Communist Party. Um, I did meet with our, our, our ambassador, and uh, it was a very good meeting, Lucy Tamlin, a couple of weeks ago to the DR Congo, and I had known that they're talking about an, an MOU, but the problem with the MOU is just aspirational. It's like sense of the Congress or sense of the Senate language. There's no teeth in it. And I'm asking you today, um, you know, I know you are very much in favor, as is the administration of electric vehicles, uh, but they should not be, uh, the supply chain should not be contingent on whether or not we get it from the DR Congo or, uh, by way of the Chinese Communist Party. Please take a look at the bill. Uh, you know, we've got to protect those kids and those adults. They are dying. We had people talk about uh, the lung diseases that they're getting. And these kids have no health care, uh, so they just die. And there's beatings that are occurring by Chinese Communist Party soldiers who are deployed there. Uh, and, and unfortunately, the DR Congo leadership just basically looks the other way because they're getting perhaps even paid off. If you could speak to the issue of the cobalt and soon the lithium that will also be coming out of the DR Congo. Well, Congressman Smith, thank you very much for your <clears throat> persistent over the years work on all of this. You've, you've been really tenacious and super focused on it. It was a pleasure to work with you on it before. Uh, let me just say to you that, that we have an MOU with the DRC and Zambia on advancing critical minerals now uh, and, and to add uh, uh, processing capacity there. So we're focused on it and um, I will convey your thoughts to the appropriate bureau in the department uh, out of this, but we thank you for that. I would appreciate that. And again, the MOU, it's a good idea, but it doesn't go far enough. It is all aspirational. And again, when the Chinese Communist Party is paying people, high government officials, and there's suggestions that yeah. that is happening, uh, you know, I would love for the DR Congo to own it all and to spread the wealth that is gleaned from that to their own people. Yeah, that have been all going and being processed uh, by the PRC, where another slave labor type process takes place once it gets to China. So Thank you. please take a look at the bill and I hope you can support it. You got it, thanks. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Mr. Huizenga for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Secretary Kerry. Um, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to ask you a couple of questions. I'm gonna, uh, before I get into um, the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment and, and some, other, uh, some other projects, I do wanna touch base on nuclear energy um, that, uh, that has been somewhat controversial. Uh, obviously, ensuring that we have sufficient base load generation is uh, significant. I served in the Michigan legislature, on, spent six years on the Energy and Technology Committee. Uh, I serve on the Financial Services Committee and do a lot of work with the development banks um, and, and have over my tenure here. And uh, I have in my district uh, one of the, f potentially one of the first projects. Uh, it's called the Palisades Power Plant in Covert, Michigan. Uh, that uh, that may be restarted. Uh, that's a it's a program uh, that uh, that is new. Uh, it was on the brink of decommissioning and and uh, and and could come back. You know, obviously the United States is uh, working to assert itself, reassert itself as a global energy leader, 
I, I think it's wise, as we saw with what was happening in uh, Europe, that uh, we break uh, our own as well as our allies' dependence on energy resources of global bad actors. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, do you, do you believe that, uh, that projects like Palisades and others that uh, potentially are on there would it help us achieve these goals and reduce CO2 emissions? Or what's your view on, on restarting some of these nuclear power plants? The Biden administration is uh, very proactive on the nuclear front. We believe that uh, uh, nuclear, that, that you can't really reach the targets that have been set without some nuclear. Okay. All right. Um, the, uh, I, I want to, uh, I think I've got about three minutes here, so I'm going to try and move quickly. Um, yeah, COP26, uh, you and Romanian President uh, uh, Klaus Johannes pledged that Romania would build a small modular nuclear reactor project in which the uh, Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment uh, invested $14 million. Uh, are there con any concerns that your policy and willingness to uh, – uh, or potential willingness to forego financial viability of, of projects to satisfy the environmental side? I mean, are you looking at the business model as you are, uh, as you are involved in these? Of course, it's imperative. Okay. All right, uh, I want to move to uh, move to a question uh, regarding sort of your your scope and and, and authority. Um, I think this is a this is a new position, uh, very very new to a lot of people, uh, including those of us that are constitutionally obligated to have oversight uh, uh, of those things. Um, and uh, and and I'm curious. Does your funding? I'm just making sure I understand. Does your funding to to fund your 45 full-time equ equivalents, your FTEs, as well as your salary and your travel, does that all come out of the State Department? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, yet you do not report to Secretary Blinken, correct? Well, I, sure I do. I mean, I <laughs> but but <laughs> a friend not, of mine. I'm not, and, I'm not trying and, to create a trap. No, no, here. no. I'm no just I know you're not. Understand. I know you're not. I'm just trying to say, formally, in terms of uh, uh, strict. Uh, so sort of legal accountability, okay. I report to the President of the United States. Okay, but that's, that's great. informally, obviously, I keep the Secretary completely. Sure. There's only that's one a, Secretary. That's informed, yes. I keep him fully and, informed. And having served I in that position. I consult with him. Uh, and uh, Reclaiming know. my time on this. Sure, go I, ahead. You, you certainly, you served in that position. Uh, in, that, uh, in that position, you had the authority and the ability to negotiate on behalf of the United States. Um, and and uh, had ability to bind it or, or speak on behalf of the president. Um, what what are the scopes of your duties with this, and under what authority are you able to go in and and uh, and be able to to all intents and purposes negotiate on behalf of the United States? Well, I'm I'm negotiating. Um, I'm, I'm formally charged by the president of the United States and his executive authority and the appropriate congressional notification uh, and approval, uh, an executive order, et cetera, that created okay. the job. So we have had special envoys for years and years and years, and we've used envoys. I don't think anything with quite this scope. Well, <laughs> that may be okay. because of the uh, scope of the problem. Sure. All right. I need to hit one last thing here. Um, in uh, March 9, 2022, an email from the SPECS office, Senior uh, Director of Climate Finance, the official wrote, that a call or meeting should be held with you soon saying, quote, I would also suggest a call or meeting soon with JK to update him on FY22 and 23, focusing on all the elements we can't put on paper. What are those, what are those elements that couldn't be put on paper? I have no idea. So it sounds like we need to pull him in to ask that question? Well, or are you know. willing to go I, ask and find out I would exactly who's Personally, talking? absolutely. I'm not sure what it is that couldn't be put on paper. All right. And I know my time is expiring here, but uh, it, it's uh, my understanding that there is a FOIA request for the fiscal 2022 that uh, State Department has said they will not be able to fulfill until 2025. April of 2025. Does that I, I sound think right to you? I spoke. Yeah. No, it doesn't sound right, but it sounds accurate. <laughs> Uh, Would that be acceptable? Spoke, you and your senatorial. No, that's that. not uh, acceptable. And I believe it was an algorithm that kicked that out kind of crazily. Maybe that's a metaphor for other kinds of challenges. But uh, no, the, I'm confident that uh, I can't imagine any FOIA that would take that long. So you'll pledge to work with us on expediting that? Well, we will communicate to the office that uh, you're asking and that it's important to try to get to it as soon as possible. Mr. Oh. Secretary, I know you have travel. We have one more member. 
to ask questions. Sure. The chair now recognizes Mr. Fluger for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for allowing me to wave on to this committee. Um, Secretary, good to see you. Um, I, I want to follow up on a couple of things. Uh, before I get, get to that, um, I know you're traveling to China. I, I hope that that will include touting American energy. Uh, China has rapidly produced coal plants uh, over the past couple of years. Uh, they are concerned about baseload capacity. They are concerned about uh, reality, and, and yet we have administration officials who are touting um, the Chinese Communist Party as the leader around the world in, in combating climate change, which is just incredulous and it's nonsense. So I hope that on your trip there that you'll tout American LNG. If we were to replace the coal plants that China has, we could reduce the CO2 footprint immediately overnight by about 50%. Yeah. Uh, so uh, following up on my colleague here, um, in your in your uh, position as special envoy, I uh, made it clear that you do negotiate, you know, on behalf of the president. But let me ask you this: um, do, do you have the authority to bind agreements? No. That, okay, so no. you're negotiating, and, and those binding agreements are the response. They're not binding. They're not. They don't become a binding agreement unless they're ratified uh, by the Congress, by the Senate, and it's not a treaty, mind you. It's an executive agreement, so it, it, it's binding between that administration and but not beyond that okay. that doesn't have the force of law and international law in, in this position do you advise president biden on energy policy uh in terms of uh, global challenges and u.s interest yes was did you advise the president um in recent months to travel to riyadh and to ask opec to increase production of oil and gas? No, I did not. So Secretary Granholm testified before me on my primary committee in energy and commerce and um, was a little wiggly on whether or not she was the primary advisor on energy policy for this uh, administration. Well, she is in, in regards to writ large, the energy policy, sure she is primary. Um, I'm glad to hear that answer. Uh, I, and I'm trying to figure out who advised the president to go to Riyadh and ask for an increase in production of oil and gas. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, in previous uh, times where, where we've had the opportunity to have you before this committee, um, I've asked uh, the question, does, do, do the renewable sources of energy uh, like wind and solar, let's just, be, let's just limit it to those, do they have the ability to provide baseload capacity in this country? Uh, backup baseload, no, but some primary they could be part of it. Yeah. But can they on their own? guarantee that when the wind isn't blowing yeah. and the sun ain't shining? No, no, that we all know. Well, I think that's good, and I'm glad to hear that, because um, that's really the fight that we're but in. But right. could with battery, could with, there's a ways to make that work. Germany is heading to a very high percentage of renewable, actually, others are. It's, I'm glad you brought up Germany. I'm, I'm actually very concerned about the path the German government has so taken. So are we. Uh, because this repower plan is completely ignoring nuclear um, and instead of having Russian natural gas, which does provide baseload capacity, they're moving in a direction that uh, could put them in, in uh, a, very, um, a very bad spot with regards to baseload capacity. Um, the, w when we look at the, the administration's desire, specifically of the EPA, uh, to, to have a mandate for EVs in this country, um, and there's, there's a couple of different timelines, how much electricity does the United States use on an annual basis right now? I don't know exactly where we are right now. Okay. I don't think uh, it's, four, it's 4,000 terawatts. How much additional demand would we need if we got to, let's just call it 50% EV mandate, 287 million cars on the road? Uh, probably double. Okay. Not sure. um, that, that's actually what the Secretary of Energy uh, said. I, I think it's it's less than that, but my, here's my point, is that I've questioned the EPA director, Regan, Secretary Granholm, Mr. Goffman, other high-ranking officials in the administration, and I don't believe anybody has done the math on this. And so there's multiple ba balls in the air here um, when we're talking about energy, and I don't think anybody in the administration has actually, I, I don't think, I know nobody has done the math on this because we can't get a straight answer and so when you go to China and talk to the Chinese about 
baseload capacity and the power that's required there, I, th I think they're doing the math on it and they're building coal plants to, to meet that demand. Actually, uh, I, I don't, uh, with all due respect, I know you represent a district that has tremendous wind and the Permian Basin and so forth, and uh, so you have a lot of knowledge of this, but I think there was a recent article showing that it was in fact renewables that kind of helped Texas through the hurdle of this heat because uh, of its reliability and where the energy comes from. But let me, let me just say to you that um, uh, I think the math, I know the math has been done, and I know that uh, there's a clarity that as the number of electric vehicles go up, as you electrify the country in various ways, you're going to need a lot more power. And that's precisely why the administration is trying to move on the permitting for many of the transmission lines that are essential to being able to get that power out there. So we have about 2,000 gigawatts now of, of uh, potential power in the queue that is not able to be deployed. Well, so if we can deploy more rapidly, we will fill the void. We will, we will meet the need. Mr. Chairman, I need 10 seconds. Um, we, we are going to enter into a crisis in this country if we do not use the resources that are primary sources of energy. I am not an all of the above fan anymore. I am a best of the above fan. And Mr. Secretary, please advocate for the best of the above in this country, which starts with primary sources like liquefied natural gas that come out of the Permian Basin that I represent. Uh, and it's critical that we lead in the world or we will be cold, dark, and do you also believe it's critical that they capture the emissions if they're going to make them? These, these companies are doing just that. We've reduced emissions, harmful emissions, ones that are listed in the Clean Air Act. And you believe that can be brought to scale we, we, we have and be affordable? It. We've scaled it in the Permian Basin. We've gone from 1 million barrels a day just 12 or 13 years ago to 5.5 million barrels a day, 43% of the total production in the United States. And in doing that, we have also reduced harmful emissions by over 40%. Well, that's great. And look, I'm as I and I've had conversations with many of the CEOs of our biggest companies, asking them and trying to get fully knowledgeable about what's doable and what isn't here. The key is, folks, we've got to meet the target of the reduction of emissions that we know will help us avoid the consequences of what's happening. That's the key. And I'm not picking which way it's going to happen. I want to see it happen, and we'll go from there. Let's use the best of the above, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for letting me wave on. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Pfluger. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your time today. Thank you for your answers uh, on this committee. We do uh, not approve of engaging in personalities with the witnesses, though it is not a rule. It's not something that we approve of. Uh, so you have our committee. Can I just mention one thing, though, Mr. Absolutely. Chairman? Absolutely. And thank you for your stewardship of this hearing, which I really appreciate. Because um, I didn't get a chance to answer it. Congressman Walsh, I think it was, whoever was asking about the airplanes. You have stuff. a couple minutes. If, as long as no, you have time, you have a couple of minutes. Because it's trivial in my mind, but I want to make it clear because it keeps sort of resurfacing. We are not, I have not, President Biden is not, we are not saying to people, you should not fly. That's not the message. The message is, let's find a way to be able to make sure when we fly, we're not leaving emissions that we can't capture or we aren't capturing them or aren't avoiding them in the first place by creating sustainable aviation fuel. So we're looking to technology to help us. And when somebody says, well, we're asking, you're asking people to sacrifice this and that. No, we don't believe that this transition actually requires sacrifice. We think it will wind up making life better, cleaner, healthier, more secure. Our country will be strengthened with clean energy and some of our own supply uh, that, that uh, avoids many of these other problems. So, uh, you know, this, this battle over the airplane or whatever is, is kind of ridiculous and not relevant to what we're really trying to achieve here. You know, we're not saying to people you shouldn't fly. You should fly, but let's find a way to make sure that's not contributing emissions. Just as when you drive, we don't want to be contributing emissions. Or when you have a building, buildings are a big source of emissions. We have to build them in a way that they're not contributing uh, pollution, which is in effect what it is, uh, in ways that, that hurts people. So that's our hope, that we can get on to a sort of more serious, how do we solve this problem, which, which I think uh, is self-evident to anybody whose eyes are open and whose mind is open at the same time.
I appreciate your closing thoughts. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's just to wrap up a few thoughts for myself, I would say this. I started with some questions myself. I did not get all the answers that I want, but it is important that your office, every office, every congressional office, that they have transparency. It's important that we know what your mission statement is, what you're trying to do on behalf of the American people, whether every American agrees with you or not. It's important for us to know those that are working in your office, what backgrounds they come from, the ways in which individuals are vetted. For me personally, you know, there's various kinds of power that we see uh, the United States of America wielding. When it's hard power, I think it's important that we put the fear of God into those that challenge us. When it's soft power, I think it's important that we look at every way in which that soft power may help Americans thrive or may help our adversaries, our enemies, or those that wish to rise up against us to potentially thrive and, and take that accordingly into account, and I hope that you do that. Um, in that, I would just say this. I, wish you well on your travels. I wish you safety on your travels. I uh, thank you for your testimony. Other members of the subcommittee may have some additional questions for the witness, and we would ask that you do respond to those in writing. And I will now recognize my colleague here, Mr. Crow, for five minutes of closing remarks, if he has any. Thank you, Chairman, and, and thank you, Secretary Kerry, for your testimony and your time here today. Um, first of all, I just want to rebut a, a couple of themes that were prevalent throughout the hearing. Uh, it is wrong to say that your office and the State Department and folks that work with you and for you uh, have been nothing but transparent. Uh, just yesterday, uh, you produced 700 pages of material in response to the request from this committee. Uh, and, and you have been, in my view, nothing but transparent and open, including today, spending well over two hours answering everybody's questions, staying until the very end, and ensuring that everybody had their, their opportunity, and I thank you for that. It is also wrong to say that engagement with the world, including with our adversaries and those who we don't ha uh, have uh, uh, you know, common ground in all areas, is in any way a, a show of weakness. Uh, you know, it is actually a show of strength to engage with the world, and to do so from a position of confidence, right? Uh, we don't have to have this crisis of confidence where we shy away from tough conversations and tough situations, and you have shown that uh, very clearly, and I applaud your effort, including today, going to have very hard conversations with, with people that we have very deep-seated disagreements with, because that's in the best interest of the American people. And it is also wrong to be the subject of personal attacks, and I'm, I'm grateful to the chairman for actually calling out but that is not uh, the course and conduct of this committee to engage in personality. So thank you, for, Chairman, uh, for mentioning that, uh, because um, you, you have been a, a public servant to this nation in a variety of capacities for your, uh, your, your adult life, including your own military service as well, uh, of which um, we find common faith and fidelity in, and, and I'm grateful uh, for that. Uh, so, uh, you know, there is the, this, this saying in politics that when you can't attack the message and you have nothing to say, you attack the messenger. And unfortunately, you are at the brunt, brunt end of that today. So um, you know, we, will, we will respond accordingly. But thank you for being calm uh, and for staying focused on the, the important issues. But these are substantive issues. And the American people deserve a full and robust discussion about it. And you have adequately outlined uh, for the committee uh, and for the American people that this is in our best economic interest. The economic future of this country relies on us making this transition. It'll be more jobs, a stronger economy, a more resilient economy, that our safety relies on us making this transition uh, in reducing uh, the risk to flood, to wildfire, to, to pandemic, to crop collapse, and so many other major crises that uh, our world and our country uh, face. And it's in our national security interest that we make this transition. Uh, that, we are be, that we will be a safer and more prosperous country if we engage globally, if we win this strategic competition around the world uh, and we address these national security issues. So thank you for making that strong case. Uh, and I join the chairman uh, in wishing you well on your, your travels. Uh, and um, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Pursuant to committee much. rules, all members may have five days to submit statements, questions, extraneous materials for the record, subject to the length limitations. Without objection, the committee stands adjourned. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.